Welcome to Unethical Podcast. is like every episode is an edit heavy episode especially with richard saying things like you can't we don't want you here if you're black that's not what i said <laughs> quoted me as that but that's not what i said you go back to the recording no he said he wanted us divided from the blacks get it right check oh, the re- yeah. check i asked i asked a question i was saying was it the blacks i did not say i wanted to be divided from the blacks. you started with the we needed to be i'm like what the blacks look how pinpointy his eyes are getting even just saying the words, do you mean the blacks? <laughs> that in itself is probably not great. <laughs> I'm just saying context is everything. Context is everything. Hence why, you know, we're talking about serial killers. And I said, we want to be divided from some people, which is obviously I'm segueing into serial killers. And then you said black people. So who's the problem here, Richard? Oh, I know. I know it's Richard. <laughs> hey, it's okay, all right. Tally and Bo get one point. Yes! Oh, that's bullshit. Are you serious? They get a point for that for, for fucking insulting me? I'll insult myself. Look, I'm fat and oh, I have no, no beard he's anymore. Going, he's going off. And he's going no, off. I want, insult, I want a point. Are you fucking kidding me? I can insult myself all day. He's so hot when he gets angry. Look at him. I'm sweaty hot <laughs> for sure. Look at this. I got pit stains for ah, fuck's sakes. Go, daddy. Go. <laughs> God. All right. Current stats uh, tally and bow leading one to nothing. It's fucking bullshit. I'm pissed about that point. I'm not going to lie. She got the answer right. Okay. If he gets so angry, he rips his shirt off. I'm going to be in heaven. He's hulking out. Is my shirt coming off for this episode? My shirt's coming off for the fucking episode. I'm just kidding. I'm not that mad yet. I'm not that mad yet. But if they keep getting free fucking points, you never should, know. then you should change into a different shirt. <laughs> uh. Okay, you guys, we have to start. This is 11. This is 11,000 words. Okay, it's 20 pages long. Send it. Send it. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to Serial Killer Trivia. Woo-hoo! Yay! This is going to be fun. This is going to be killer. Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slay. <laughs> okay, question number one. Upon his arrest, the investigators who searched his house said that the entire house was a, quote, pigsty, except for one room. Fuck, my Google skills are poor. Tally and Bo, what's your answer? Michael, no, joking. Go, Tally. <laughs> mm, that one guy, ba- ba- Picton. Richard and Justin, do you have an answer? Ed Gein. They are correct. Yes! That's a fucking point. It's a tie ball game, kids. He used to keep his mom's room super clean. And he used to just, the rest of the house is a fucking disaster. He was a psycho. He was crazy. He was Oh, he kept his mom's room clean? Yeah. Yeah. For a bonus point, which ho- which room in the house was pristine? Mom's! <laughs> mom's room! I answered it first! Now I know. Now I know there's going to be follow-up questions. I'm keeping my mouth shut. Sorry, Justin. That's that's on me. That's the rules. That's the fucking rules, Richard. And I got that point because I answered it first after she asked the question. Richard, would you describe yourself as A, competitive? (laughs) (laughs) B, competitive. Or C, I'm right and fuck you. How's that? C. (laughs) (laughs) Or D, all of the above, you dumb fuck. (laughs) Nobody waited, so everybody gets the point. Actually, you know what? No, nobody waited, so nobody gets the point. Fuck off. No, no. But I I worked hard on this, motherfuckers. I think the guy that was uh, humble enough to let the other team have the point should actually have the point in the end because they're a good spirit of uh... nature. You will literally take any angle, won't you, Richard? <laughs> you are a whore. <laughs> You're a point whore. Another interesting fact about Ed Gein, he used to dance in the moonlight on his property or in cemeteries wearing a lady skin suit. Oh, gross. Among the filth in the house, they also found the infamous skin suit, a second half skin suit, a belt of nipples, a drawstring made with human lips, 
and a lampshade made from a human face. <laughs> what a great way to, to remember who you've been with. <laughs> oh my God. Did he make that wallet out of foreskins and any time he rubbed it, it turned into a briefcase? Yes. I don't know what that means, but yes. Oh, because erections, I guess. Yeah, because it's erection day here. So, for anybody who doesn't know, Ed Gein was the inspiration behind some of your spooky movie favorites, including Norman Bates, Leatherface, and Buffalo Bill. Put it in a basket. He puts the lotion on. A little bit about, about Ed Gein. Actually, the whole story of Ed Gein, but in an abridged version. Ed Gein's childhood was rough. He had a highly religious and overbearing mother who wouldn't allow him to make friends or leave his home for any reason but school. His peers saw him as shy and awkward, so they weren't that willing to make friends with him anyway. In 1940, when when Gein was 33, his father died from heart failure caused by alcoholism. In 1944, his brother died. Ed claimed that they were using fire to clear marshland and Henry's death was an accident. Even though authorities found that Hen- Henry Gein was dead before the fire began and he had bruises on his head, they ruled the death an accident, leaving Ed alone with his mother at the farmhouse. The following year, Gein's mother, Augusta, died after a series of strokes. Gein spent the next 13 years minding his own business, but some witnesses say he could occasionally be seen dancing in the moonlight on his property. In November of 1957, police paid Gein a visit following the disappearance of local hardware owner Bernice Warden. Gein had been seen in her shop the day before looking to place an order for a gallon of antifreeze, and the receipt at her store showed that the final sale the day she disappeared had been a pickup for a gallon of antifreeze. Gein was arrested, and the search of his property revealed many unimaginable horrors. In addition to his collection of human skin accessories, there were bones and bone fragments everywhere. His kitchen was filled with utensils and crockery made from human bones. He even adorned his ghoulish bed with two human skulls, one on each bedpost. Oh my God, how creative. That's one way to look at it. (laughs) I would say he was the most creative of all the uh, serial killers out there. Honestly, I'll give you He was an artist. Crafty. Could you imagine using a fork, right? And you know how the whole new thing at the moment is like mouthfeel? Could you imagine like getting a fork and you're like, mm, mm, this is a good mouthfeel. It's like, oh, I've got a, a seasoned nine-year-old boy for the caviar spoon, if you'd like. Like, you oh, could, uh, that's smart. What is nine-year-old boy caviar exactly? It's not the caviar no, that comes no, from No, not the, the caviar. It's the... Not the caviar, the spoon. Oh, <laughs> harvesting the eggs from a nine-year-old boy (laughs) good on him for not wasting anything you know if you're gonna kill it then if you're gonna do it do it right and he's done it right so the only fresh body on the scene was that of bernice warden the store owner and she had been strung up and gutted like a deer with her head hanging in a burlap sack and her heart in a plastic bag near the stove oh my oh he's gonna eat that I've, i've eaten duck hearts before oh yeah but you haven't eaten her heart have you i've never eaten human heart no never you really emphasize that point i have a feeling you might have eaten a little bit have 100 percent eaten hot yep i was friends with the with the town mortician is this why she keeps saying that no one dies in minnesota because she's the one eating all their hearts she's eating all the bodies that makes so much sense i don't want to suck your blood i want to suck your blunt it's not where i thought you were going with that yeah <laughs> Yep. So all of these parts would mean an awful lot of people going missing in this little bubble of Plainfield, Wisconsin, without notice. It would be, if not for the fact that all but two known victims were pulled from three nearby cemeteries. Ah, body snatching, eh? Welcome back, body snatching. Yeah, this this story has everything. Oh, it does. <laughs> Gein claimed that he made about 40 trips out looking for bodies, but only returned with a body nine times. He said that he started collecting women to make a woman's skin suit so he could, quote, crawl into the skin of his mother. Yep. Uh, Sigmund Freud would have had a field day with this guy. (laughs) Yeah. So if there is a untold boy meets girl, girl loves man in skin, girl skin, situation and happily ever after this story will have literally every facet that needs to happen and i'm so here for it and if the skin suit 
falls off, it's a Freudian slip. Oh! Oh, God, that was so good! <laughs> I think Bo literally just came. Oh, my God, that was... She legitimately fell out of the chair. I feel like I'm being mocked. No, I slid <laughs> off my chair. That was so good. Freudian slid. You, I was just about to say, you Freudian slipped out of your chair. Yeah, I Freudian slipped out of my chair. That was so good. Oh, swings and roundabouts. That was fantastic. It was discovered that some of the pieces in the house once made up the body of Mary Hogan, a local barkeep who went missing in 1954. He killed her too. Oh, are you all right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay good all right so ed Gein did confess to her murder as well yeah, he would go in and like he would dig up graves and then rebury them so there's a lot of times that he would just take the nipple like he would just take some shit a lot of them you would take the whole thing if you wanted it but he was just at at the end he was looking for certain sizes for his fucking skin suit so he would just uh he was a fucking crazy man a, a madman he took nine full bodies. Mutilating yeah. a corpse. There is an actual court of law charge for that. Well, leave the guy alone. They're dead. Good. Ed Gein was, uh, was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and he died in a mental hospital in 1984 at the age of 77. You know what? He loved it there, too. That was the best part. Did he get to see his life work come to fruition? Like, did all his accessories come? One skin suit was complete. He had another half skin suit brewing. Well, for summer months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, didn't, it didn't make the MoMA. It didn't make the MoMA, okay. Uh, but yeah, it got saw. It got seen by a lot of people. Probably more if it didn't make, if, uh, if it did make the Museum of Modern Art, it would probably seen less people than it did, like, since now. It's probably seen more people... Did he only start killing people after his mom died or before? He killed after his mom died. No, not before. Not before. The first, the, uh, she, Augusta died in 1945 and his first murder was 1954. But did he kill his brother? Is that like what they think happened? It's up in the air. And, and uh, Harold Schechter says no. And he did, uh, he wrote uh, Deviant, which is the book about uh Gein, and he doesn't think so i just listened to an interview with him not that long ago uh so i'm gonna go with he probably didn't but what happened with Gein is that after they found his house of horrors they started looking for people that were missing and looking for people that were murdered and just attributed them to him anyway we're proof or not because it was easy but it could, he could have killed him too that's the thing is Gein wasn't really under anyone's radar like when when what's her name went missing uh, the, the lady from the corner store or whatever, I can't remember her name. He, they would be like, I haven't seen her in a couple days. And Ed Gein would be like, yeah, she's in my house hanging on meat hooks. And everyone would go like, ha, 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 oh, Eddie, you're so funny. But she really was fucking sitting there on meat hooks. So, uh, yeah, he was he's so innocent that people just, he was slow, right? He was like, yeah, I don't think he killed his brother. But maybe, like, maybe that's why. He wasn't a burner. He wasn't an arsonist. Yeah. Arsonist? Yes, that's the right word. And that's, that's our summary on Ed Gein. Basically everything you need to know. <laughs> We've gained a bunch of knowledge. <laughs> Question number two. This killer had an uncharacteristically whimsical job in a chocolate factory to pay the bills while pursuing his real passion. Well, Google was no help because I Googled chocolate factory killer. And it said, Willy Wonka is a child serial killer. So, yep, I'm sticky. <laughs> it was. Tally and Bo, do you have your answer? Oh, d -d 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 Dahmer. Richard and Justin, do you have your answer? We were going to go with Jeffrey Dahmer as well. For a bonus point, why was he eventually fired from this job? For eating all the dark chocolate. Being creepy to patrons. Putting his willy in the chocolate. Not not coming to work. Richard's got it. Damn, God fucking damn it, Richard. Fuck. <laughs> uh -huh. Fuck. Word, brah. Another interesting fact about Dahmer, at one point, he had so many bodies in his apartment, he ran out of room to store them. He ended up keeping one of them in his bathtub. He would stand straddling the body while he showered to get ready for work. <laughs> 
God, could you imagine how much that would stink? Like that would smell so bad because the shit that comes off you when you're obviously having a shower, getting all caught in the crevices of that body. Oh, you know he's pissing on it. You know he's taking. His yeah, he's piss pissing on it. on it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's it definitely has a reek for sure. Plus rotting flesh. Who knows? In a in water. Yeah. Well, he, who knows how stripped it was? What's a little bit of decom? Yeah. A lot. Oh. <laughs> I heard. I heard that it's a smell you'll never forget. I don't know though. I heard that too. Uh, soldiers at war say that no matter how long that they are that they serve that they're in battle they never get used to it are you any are you any killed boys and men are you blowing celeste wad right now oh, i wish I blow my wad <laughs> i wish <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> jeffrey dahmer was your typical run-of-the-mill juvenile delinquent he was popular during childhood and still well liked even in high school when he started to become more withdrawn His interests turned to binge drinking and examining animal carcasses while he was still very young. Basically Aussie. Right. (laughs) He committed his first murder in 1978 at the age of just 18. His first victim was a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks, who Dahmer picked up and brought back to his father's house, where he hit him over the head with a dumbbell. Dahmer said that he decided to kill Stephen because he was going to leave and he just wanted him to stay. Calm and collected, Dahmer dismembered and pulverized the body into unrecoverable mush before scattering it in the backyard like compost. Okay, good. Look it after the lawn. Very talented young serial killer. Lonely. With what t- talented as as in can get away with murder? Right away. At 18, his first shot, it was an impulse kill. Just very talented young man. It's funny that he waited until like he was actually a government recognized citizen before he committed crimes. Because as a youth offender, you get slaps on the wrist a few times. Yeah, I'm going to go with you don't start by killing people and nothing else before that. I'm sure he was doing some crazy shit in his teens that are just not as widely known. Documented. yeah, the, the seats and everything else that he made, like, that that overtook it. So Dahmer was booted from college the following year because of his drinking, at which point his father made him join the army. And he served as a combat medic in Germany from 1979 to 1981 before being discharged for, once again, his drinking. His father was having none of that shit and sent Dahmer to Wisconsin to live with his grandmother. Well, his grandparents. No, his grandmother. Yeah, it was just his grandmother. Uh, His grandmother wasn't much of a disciplinarian, and Dahmer spent his free time frequenting gay bathhouses where he would drug and rape other men between 1982 and 1987. Mm, Okay. Yeah, okay, sounds good. He's a lot more wild than I thought he was. Like, pictures of him and stuff, he seems very, uh... uh, I don't want to say charismatic, um what word am i looking for like no oh yeah model model good looks no like poised like not clumsy is what i meant like maybe maybe uh well groomed there we go well groomed poised prep like a preppy boy he looked like he shot the kmart to me i have never once thought a serial killer was attractive and i will say this publicly right now (laughs) <laughs> several times we know Good. we trust you <laughs> yeah he had no problem picking up gay dudes from the bar not at all yeah absolutely and he was he looks tall which is another he is tall he looks like my yeah. ex not gonna lie mm, yuck and i didn't think my ex was like hot or anything you know what i'm saying like i was like yeah he's like he's tall and skinny which is what i like fair so Dahmer murdered his second victim 10 years after the first. Uh, and this was in 1987. He found his second Stephen, Stephen Tuomi, in a bar and invited him to a hotel room. So Dahmer claims that he has no memory of this murder. He just remembers waking up in the morning and seeing that Stephen had been beaten to death. Oh, because he was pissed drunk. Uh, sure. Sure. He drank a lot. Sure. <laughs> So Dahmer's murders picked up speed and evolved very quickly after this second murder. He would find his victims in bars, take them home to strangle them. And between 1988 and 1990, he killed seven men. 
At some point, he began to familiarize himself with bodies after death in new and depraved ways. He would use their bodies for sex after they died. He would take photographs of them in various states of dismemberment. He would meticulously preserve parts of them, most often the head and the wiener, and he would take cuts of their body to eat. Good on him preserving the wiener. Yeah. Probably for, he probably stuck them in the freezer for like his own personal dildo. Apparently like, what's that word? Dead people. Yeah, no, he, 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 he ate them. He ate them. He was oh, he's eating smoked sausages. He was, yes, in fact. <laughs> A rump just roast. Chuck a, just chuck him on the barbie. Chuck a frozen wiener on the barbie. Yes. First thing I'd eat is a butt cheek. That is what most serial killers eat first. <laughs> rump roast. Yeah. yeah. I think I like, I, that's a funny word. Okay. I'd go for a thigh or a calf. <laughs> I bet the ass is very well marbled. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it's being Yes, that. Which it was in this case. <laughs> oh my. Well, you don't know. Is he a top or a bottom? We didn't ask that question. That oh, he's a, a top. Oh, play. he's a top. He's a top, yeah. Heavy top. Heavy, heavy top. Power top. It's called power top. Um, okay, in 1989, Dahmer was arrested and sentenced to one year in House of Correction after drugging and molesting a 13-year-old boy. During his sentence, he was allowed work release in order to keep his job at the chocolate factory. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't fired for this. He wasn't fired for going to prison for molesting a 13-year-old from his jog at the chocolate factory. If you're gonna fire someone for that, if it's something, I imagine that you would want to fire someone for that. Like I don't think you go cool. into the place and go like I got arrested for molesting a child. I think you go like I was arrested and have to do house arrest. Can I still work here? Like I don't think you tell them all the details, especially if it's molesting a kid, but maybe. He wasn't under house arrest. He was in he was in prison. He was allowed oh, to go to work, work and come back whatever. to prison. Yeah. If he was on a work release uh program with the prison, the prison uh the work the oh my gosh, the job would have all of his details. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, they'd have to know. Have to, yep. Cause he's being delivered hand delivered in cuffs, uncuffed at the door. Well, and they have to make sure that the job meets all the requirements of his work release program. Obviously, if this chocolate factory was, in fact, a chocolate shop crawling with fat little kids, they wouldn't let him work there. Augustus Gloop, Augustus Gloop. So he was released after only 10 months, and he continued working at the chocolate factory until he was fired for chronic absenteeism. Upon his release, he moved back into his infamous Milwaukee apartment, or pardon me, he moved into his infamous Milwaukee apartment. He wasn't living here before. And he began pursuing his real passion, which was turning men into youthful, submissive, sexual zombies. Sign. During this experimental (laughs) period, Dahmer was killing one victim a week and testing his hypothesis by drilling holes in their heads and pouring boiling water or hydrochloric acid into their brains. What? What theory is he testing? What theory? No, he wanted to make them zombies. Yeah, he wanted to make them non, just be shells of humans. I feel like he didn't, I, I feel like he wasn't going about it the right way. Anyway, sorry, continue. Get, cut him some slack. He didn't go to college. <laughs> <laughs> So at one point, one of Dahmer's victims managed to escape his apartment and flag down help. Two people stopped to help 14-year-old Conorak Synthesomphony. I don't know if that sounds good to me. Synthesomphone. I'm I'm sorry. I don't know. Uh, He was was Laotian. 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 He was from, he was from, yes, that. Laotian. He was. (laughs) Um. So they stopped him because they could see that he was naked, cut, and bleeding down his thighs. Dahmer approached the three of them and tried to convince the bystanders that the boy was his partner, Jim, but Dahmer was agitated and kept changing his story. So the bystanders stood their ground and they called the police. So Dahmer did wait with them. He didn't try to flee. And when the police arrived to the scene, Dahmer convinced them that the naked 14-year-old was in fact his 19-year-old boyfriend and he was very, very drunk and they were having a lover's quarrel. So the police did not bother running a background check on Dahmer, who was a convicted sex offender, but they did check his apartment and found nothing unusual upon a cursory glance. How? I have no idea. It was full of body parts. And so they released the adolescent boy back into the arms of the Milwaukee cannibal. 
Uh, tapes from the dispatcher that were released could hear you could hear police officers chuckling as they reported that the quote intoxicated naked Asian male had been returned to his sober boyfriend. Hmm. Once back inside the apartment, Conorak was strangled and dismembered, and his head was stored in Dahmer's fridge. Yeah, getting away with that would have made the whole situation so much more enjoyable, and that makes me feel really sad for him, for that kid. Oh, time and time again, they had so much chances to catch Dahmer, and they just never did. Like it's so because he's like cute or whatever. Because he's charming, like... charismatic, <laughs> manipulative. All right, for the last goddamn time, Western society attractive does not equal nice Dahmer was actually on the surface a nice guy I'm like literally I'm saying on the surface he would help his elderly neighbors bring in their groceries he would say hello to them all the time like well, he was, of course because he's manipulative he was always helping people push in their stool <laughs> oh my god so Dahmer was finally captured after Tracy Edwards, a man Dahmer lured to his apartment, was able to fight him off and escape. When police arrived at the apartment, they found photographs of corpses and body parts in plain view, which allowed them to immediately arrest Dahmer and search his apartment. They found several pieces of human remains in the apartment, including seven skulls, four severed heads, a human heart, and several cuts of human meat in the refrigerator. Dahmer was charged with 15 murders. He pleaded insanity in court, but he was declared sane and sentenced to 15 life terms, a total of 957 years in prison. He also received an additional life sentence later for the murder of Stephen Hicks, his first victim. Dahmer was attacked twice in prison. The first time fellow inmate Osvaldo Duruthi attempted to slit his throat, but it wound up being superficial wounds. The second time, Christopher Scarver, an inmate he was cleaning the shower with, asked him if the newspaper stories were true about the necrophilia and the cannibalism. Dahmer confirmed that they were, and Scarver beat him over the head with a metal pipe, causing fatal head trauma before he, Christopher Scarver, went and killed a second inmate, Jesse Anderson. Dahmer died in the hospital one hour after arriving on November 18th, 1994. Scarver said that he had murdered Dahmer because he was a pain in the ass that would pull pranks on the other inmates and crack cannibal jokes constantly. Dahmer liked to make human limbs out of prison food and ketchup and leave them in places that other people would find them, as well as walk up behind people and say that he was going to eat them or bite them or that they would taste good. And he was also an insufferable born-again Christian convict. That's funny, too. You, can't be a, you cannot be a cannibal Christian. Ask Fuck them. off, you can't eat my this is my body. Eat me. They eat Jesus, yeah. They, they're I the mean, most cannibalistic it, ones out of I, all of them. You know what I'm saying though. Not Jesus himself. I eat bread every day. Like I literally ate Jesus before I came up here. So you've been drinking him all night. I why? Yeah. Dahmer to me is like one of the more sympathetic of the serial killers. Uh in a way, because if you ever watch interviews with him and his parents, they fucking did a shit ton of interviews too. And they're jackasses to the max, but him, he genuinely feel like, I feel like, and maybe it's not genuine, but I feel like he is the one with the most remorse out of all of them. And he did the craziest shit uh, because he was really uh, closeted for being his gay self. And I feel like that helped him move into the, like the, the shame of it and smashing the people, killing them and stuff. I think that went uh, part of it. And he even admits to this later on. He's like, I wish I could have just been normal. But he's also a narcissist and will say what you want to hear. Sure. And I've watched a lot of serial killer stuff and I don't get the same vibes from him as I do from like Charles Manson or like uh, Bundy or something like that. I don't care. He doesn't he doesn't show remorse when he's sneaking up on people still in prison being like i'm gonna eat you. oh i'm i'm uh I, i'm that's not remorseful <laughs> that's survival though he was like a little weird. oh no it ain't that's I, gonna I be a jackass but, well that too because yeah, he it's... did die yeah no I mean, he deserved to die I, i'm not <laughs> saying that he's a good just in if you watch him he's like a little teddy bear after and he like has this interview with his parents it's it's different it's not the same as other ones it, it's weird he's he's an enigma to me He's not a wild-eyed lunatic. What you got, Celeste? Got question three. Who's ready? Oh, daddy. Question three. This killer would always cut the throats of his victims first in order to exsanguinate the body. 
Tally and Bo, do you have your answer? Oh, Robert Picton, pig, pig farmer. He's going to be my answer for everything. He's weird. Richard and Justin, do you have your answer? Uh, we think it may be Richard Chase, but we're not sure. First hint. He did this before starting his ritual eviscerations. Ramirez. One more hint. He was never caught. Oh, Jack the Ripper. Yes, it is. Sick. Nice. Good job, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay, Bo. Jeez. Aggression's not necessary here. <laughs> For a bonus point. In 2014, scientists claimed they matched the DNA from the shawl found next to Catherine Eddowes to the real Jack the Ripper, revealing his true identity. Many people still believe this to be true. Who did they say was Jack the Ripper? H.H. H. Holmes. No. Not Winston Churchill, the, 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 the fucking other guy. No. <laughs> Benjamin Disraeli. No. It was, in fact, Aaron Kosminski, the 23-year-old barber who was a suspect at the time. It's cooler if it's A.J. Holmes. <laughs> Sorry. I think, he, I think he'd be linked by now. Another interesting fact about Jack the Ripper, many people believe that Jack the Ripper was actually a woman, a midwife specifically, who would be able to get close to the prostitutes, develop trust with them, and also have substantial knowledge about human anatomy, specifically Jack the Ripper's favorite part, the uterus my man no i don't believe that my man my man (laughs) i've been plowing uterus like you've been plowing uterus for years don't they think he was a physician Mm, some sort they think that he he had anatomical knowledge from one reason or from one source or another that being said i like the theory that it's a woman because i think it would make sense because prostitutes like pregnancies childbirth they attack the uterus it makes sense particularly if it was a woman who couldn't have children i'm gonna do a dicks i'm gonna do a dicks eventually on them on on our boy on our boy jack the ripper well we're covering the victims here because we can't really cover the killer all right in 1888 the area surrounding the Whitechapel district in london lived under a shadow of an invisible killer Though he only hunted in a very small area, the reputation of Whitechapel spread far beyond the city and across the sea into the myths and legends of grisly horror. His reign of terror coincided with the Whitechapel murders, a period in which many murders different from those of Jack the Ripper were also occurring. And so there may be some crossover between these victims, but only five are definitively linked to Jack the Ripper. I think think they call him Jack the Ripper because he ripped the nipples off, right? They called him Jack the Ripper because he named himself Jack the Ripper oh you shouldn't name yourself that's so stupid oh yeah on august 31st 1888 the body of marianne polly nichols was found in bucks row marianne was remembered by her neighbors as a remarkably clean lady despite being a prostitute and an alcoholic she had been killed where she was found just under the window of a home with four people inside who saw and heard nothing Her skirts had been above her waist when she was spotted earlier that morning by a nice gentleman who was late for work, but he pulled them down before he went about his business and didn't report it. No one needs to be walking around saying this lady's knickers or pulled the skirt down over the top. (laughs) People are staring at a fanny, for God's sake. I don't want people seeing that woman's fanny. You guys are giving him way too much credit. He called another dude over. He was like, dude, come look at this. Come look at this. And then he touched her to see if she was dead. Yeah. And she wasn't, uh, her chest was rising. He couldn't find a pulse, but her chest was rising. So she was breathing. Uh-huh. And then um, he, the other guy was like, oh, well, like we should help her. And the dude was like, I'm not touching her again. Pulled her skirts down and left. <laughs> so Christopher Cross, not a nice man. Doing something's better than nothing. Anyway. He, pu- he pulled her knickers down. It was 1888, man. People were dead in the street all the time. I don't know much I trust like, information from back then to like there's got to be missing pieces you know like like a uterus <laughs> not this one <laughs> save that joke for later <sighs> i'll say it again in a bit there is actually a fantastic website it is literally jacktheripper.org it has every single detail that has like ever been uncovered in this case every single document every single it's crazy it is 
so in depth. It's very cool. And it's got everything about the Whitechapel murders too. It's it's cool. It's good to read. All right. So Marianne, she was missing five teeth and had a large bruise, likely from a fist on the side of her face. Uh But it was determined that this was from a previous encounter and did not happen during the Ripper attack. The Ripper slit her throat from ear to ear. And I mean, literally with precision right below the ear to right below the ear. She had several deep gashes all over her abdomen, but that is the extent of her wounds. She is considered the first of the Jack the Ripper victims. Gash. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Man, keep it in your pants. Yeah, man. (laughs) My bad. On September 8th, 1888, Annie Chapman was found. Annie was described by her friends as a sober woman, despite her fondness for rum, which says a lot about how wasted (laughs) everyone was. That, you know what? She's sober than everybody else. Okay, (laughs) it's more sober than me, apparently. Uh, On the night that she was murdered, she was short for money for her bed at at her lodging, and the night watchman allegedly chastised her, saying, you have money for beer, but not for your bed. So she was a a sober drunk. Definitely a drunk, okay? Like, definitely a drunk. Uh, She was actually also eating a baked potato, which isn't relevant at all. I just like the idea of a woman in a Victorian (laughs) dress carrying around a baked potato like a burrito. Did they have tinfoil in 1888? I wonder what the fuck it was in. Like, what was she eating? Probably a rag. (laughs) Like, wrapped burrito style. When you need to eat and you, you're fanging for a potato, like that is just a, that is a smart snack to keep you going. <laughs> it's like a big fucking French fry. Potatoes. Yeah, I don't think they had choice much. They're, like there'd be like, do you want potatoes for supper or like. Or polio. Yeah. So you go, you pick one of the two. Bread. The bread was always moldy and the potatoes, potatoes you could eat for like ever. She wanted a potato. Okay. <laughs> she just wanted to eat a potato. I got you. Um, Okay, so she had been found in the position of a woman giving birth with her knees pulled up and to the side and her skirts were lifted above her waist. Despite a handkerchief being around her neck, her throat was also surgically cut from ear to ear. There were spots of blood on the wall behind her indicating that the throat had been cut in a sitting position before she fell to the ground. The coroner believed that an attempt had been made to fully decapitate her, but the spine was still attached. Her abdomen had been completely opened. Her intestines were removed and placed on her shoulder, and the uterus and two-thirds of her bladder were removed. So the precision and knowledge that would have had to go into this evisceration indicated advanced medical knowledge. And so the coroner speculated that it would have that would have it would have been it would oh my gosh. It would have had to have been someone in the medical field, and it would have taken anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And this woman was found out in the open. Yeah, that's it's kind of the reason I don't believe the 23 year old theory. Like, you'd have to years of medical knowledge. I get the 23 year old barbers, and barbers used to be the medical professional guys, but I mean, you're still only 23 years old. Like, it's not very sanitary or sterile doing it out in the open. Yeah, his survival rate probably wasn't great. No. What's weird to me, though, too, I mean, people back then, it was a much more agrarian time, and people were used to slaughtering animals. I don't think you have to be a goddamn uh, That's true. have a medical degree to know a lung from a intestine, or you know what I mean? But it's the precision, I think. I think it's the precision that they they think is is what makes them a medical professional. Not because you could anyone could go in there and get a fucking ovary out if you want to just hack it open, but without damaging everything else and making it clean cuts and stuff like that. That's that's not an you easy can task. rip organs out too. Yeah, the membranes were cleanly severed <laughs> when the intestines were removed. They managed to take out her uterus without damaging her cervix. So was she was uh, her wound still open or was she stitched back up? She, no, she was just, she was flayed open. Oh, okay. Like a human parachute. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I got it. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. On September 27th, 1888, the Dear Boss letter arrived at the Central News Agency. So this letter was initially believed to be a hoax, but when details in the letter were consistent with the next victim found, the police believed that it was legitimate. The letter read... Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. 
That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me in my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands, curse it. No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. Yeah, I think a doctor would know blood would clot, that he couldn't use it for ink after a few days. Proper red stuff. Proper red stuff. Yeah. On September 30th at 1 a.m., the body of Elizabeth Stride was found in Burner Street. Elizabeth's prostitution was only a part-time gig. Her main source of income was sewing and charring. She was described as a woman who would do a good turn for anyone, but she was also a drunk. Such a drunk, in fact, that she was frequently appearing before the Thames Magistrate Court for being drunk and disorderly and swearing like a sailor. Good thing you don't go to court for that anymore. You can go to court for drunk and disorderly. Drunk and disorderly, yeah. <laughs> okay, so in Minnesota, there's no drunk in public, but there is disturbing the peace. Mm. I've had one, not the other, because I live in Minnesota. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like 200 bucks. And an apology letter. To who? To my neighborhood that I had to, that had to be like printed in the neighbor in the paper. Oh my god, that sounds like such a. You will say sorry. You go and say sorry to them now. Public shaming. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm female. Of course, they're gonna do that. Uh, so Elizabeth was found by a local jeweler who was driving his cart past the entrance to Dutsfield's yard. Uh, his pony apparently stopped and refused to go any further. And when he went to investigate, he saw Elizabeth's body. Her throat was cut from ear to ear. The coroner noted that her left earlobe was torn, which was ominously similar to the Ripper letter. But the wound was fully healed, and he believed that it was likely the result of an earring being ripped off. Yeah. Yep. Unlike the other victims, Elizabeth Stride was not mutilated on her, or the other victim, I should say, was not mutilated on her abdomen, possibly because the Ripper's ritual evisceration was interrupted, or possibly because he was tired from the first murder of the evening. Oh, it does say, it it would take it out of you, really. Like, he wants to do it right. He's probably tired, needs needs a potato, like... (laughs) <laughs> he's a dry potato to keep keep going nobody's serving potato it's just bread day bullshit it's, it's bread day he doesn't have any potatoes like i see yep i'm i'm aligned i'm on board <laughs> within an hour of the discovery of elizabeth stride's body another body was found in the city of london the body of Catherine eddowes as a result the city of london police was on the case So compared to the other victims, Catherine was a sophisticated Londoner. She was described as scholarly and intelligent, but with a violent temper. Sorry, that's a good one. Like, it was scholarly. She was very scholarly lady, but she has a temper. Yeah, I bet you her temper was like, uh, sorry, man. And then they're like, whoa, relax, woman. Why are you talking so loud? You know, that's what kind of temper she had back then. Like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I disagree with you, sir. Well, you need to keep your voice down, woman. You need to calm down. This woman is suffering from hysteria. Are you on your monthlies? I say we should cut out her uterus. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We'll stop your monthlies if we just get rid of your uterus. <laughs> <laughs> and your fucking throat. <laughs> that will stop you from talking. You know what? That all makes sense. I think I think you guys might be on to something. I don't think she was a ripper victim at all. I think she was just stepping out of line. Ear to ear means both jugulars were cut, right? Oh, well, they go right across. Yeah, <laughs> they cut out his eyes <laughs> around the temple, across the eyes. That's what ear to ear means. <laughs> Over the nose, around the back. 
on the back of her skull ear to ear. Yeah, like, so she looks like she had one of those hair transplants where the back of her head's up here. <laughs> this is crazy shit, man. All right. Catherine wasn't actually far from death herself before her run-in with the Ripper. She was in the advanced stages of Bright's disease, which affects the kidneys and the heart, and Jack is yelling. The Ripper? <laughs> So Catherine was found with the same throat wound and an abdominal evisceration as Annie Chapman, but this time a piece of her intestine had been severed and placed on the left side of her body. Uh, and this time the Ripper decided to get medical with her face. Most notably, the tip of her nose had been cut off. Part of her lip was split up to her nostril and her eyelids were cut. Uh, okay, so if you guys thought that the torn earlobe was ominous, but coincidental, you could be right. But Catherine's earlobes were severed and removed. The Ripper also removed and took her left kidney and her uterus. And he took the pretty kidney. The remaining kidney was pale and bloodless because of the Bright's disease. Hey, so what an elitist. <laughs> is, is Bright's due to alcoholism? No, no. It's it's a, an immune an immune disorder, I think. It's it's not called that anymore. That's a term of the time. Because of Catherine Eddowes missing earlobes, on October 1st, the Jack the Ripper letter was publicized, cementing the nickname for all eternity, and the police hoped that someone would recognize the handwriting and they would find the killer. That did not happen, and the same day, another letter arrived at the news agency. This one was not publicized at the time. It read... I was not coddling, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jack's work tomorrow, double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off. Ha, not the time to get ears for police. Which I think was a pun, which I enjoy. <laughs> ah, excellent. Mm. It took me a second. Same. Celebrities, they're just like us. <laughs> Wait, we're celebrities? No, the Ripper is the celebrity. He makes puns, we make puns, he's just like us. Uh, thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again, Jack the Ripper. So it is possible but highly unlikely that anyone except the Ripper would have known about the two women both being murdered on the same day. Especially since the letter arrived the day after it happened and they were found in the middle of the night. How would they expect someone to be able to understand, uh, recognize the handwriting? Especially back then. Yeah, A being the times and B, like, it's just, I'm, I'm following along. That's not the right letter. That was a different letter that was sent later. The first letter had pretty, like, distinct handwriting. Were they able to confirm that the two were sent from the same person? No. No, they okay. weren't. And the, the handwriting does appear a bit different. But that being said, because he worked with a knife, it's possible he had a wound on his hand. There's a lot of different yeah. possibilities that could explain it. Ah. Yeah. I'm so invested. I'm, my, I'm like, I'm visually getting pictures as you're talking. Yeah. Well, here we go. That letter that you just had on October 16th, George Lusk, the president of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, received a letter containing half a kidney. Ew. Yeah, gross. <laughs> Ew. It read. From hell, Mr. Lusk, sorry, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman and preserved. And preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. So the letter, as I mentioned, was like tot almost illegible. The spelling errors were crazy. He preserved the kidney in wine. It's possible he was just super fucking drunk from eating the first one. <sighs> Hard to say. Wine is a pretty good marinade. I will give it that. Is it? Yes. Okay. White for chicken, red for red meat, obviously. The main reason that this is considered part of the three letters that they believe are legitimate is because Catherine Eddowes was missing a kidney. He sent them a kidney. Wow. The dots just keep connecting. Uh, nowadays, I don't think there'd be, I think the Jack the Report have been caught pretty quick with the technology we have now. It's just. Oh, he's, he's the BTK of back then, eh? 
I'd say. Yeah, bold, liked interacting with news agencies and the police and, and very cocky. Yeah. I'm 100% that person. If I was a serial killer, I would be making sure everybody knew it. You'd be hiring, hiring a skywriter and all that shit. Yep. And then I'd be telling everybody how clever I was. 100%. That's me as a serial killer. I'd be like, oh, I did I did it this way so that you couldn't tell that I hired the skywriter. Pew, pew, so cool. But that, that's how I would do it. If I was a serial killer, I would start ordering plane tickets in Bo's name. <laughs> <laughs> and depend it on her because she would be so openly admitting to it all. <laughs> if you follow Bo's model, you won't be a serial killer because you'll only get one. I was just about to say, so if you were a serial killer, you'd never be a serial killer. Yes. Like she never said when she was a murderer, she'd have to kill three then start bragging. She can't well, well yeah. <laughs> right it's three people uh, over a, a series of, over a different time like it can't be yeah it can't be one after the other but no, the last guy the last guy we talked about killed someone 10 years later yeah that's that's serial killer behavior spree killer or uh mass murderer those would be like day like all at once yeah oh gotcha 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 yeah yeah on November 9th, the final victim, Mary Kelly, was found in her lodging. She was well liked by the people around her, except for her landlord, who said she was too loud when she drank. <laughs> Sounds like everyone I know. Sounds like everyone in this story. Everyone is drunk all the time. And this is how people describe them, too, which is weird, right? Because if everybody is drunk, which it seems like there is, why would you bother mentioning that they were drunk when you were talking about them? Everyone's drunk. No, oh, being drunk is one thing. Being drunk eight the 1888 drunk is different than like just or 19 or whatever uh, 1888 early 1900 drunk is different than being drunk now they used to drink in america three times more alcohol uh than what the average is now because whiskey was like almost as cheap as water to get back then that's america uh i don't know what british was the highest rate now is like four Anyways, I'm doing that stupid toe episode and for, I don't want to give it away, but a lot, they used to drink a shit ton of alcohol back then. And it was way more normal. There was like a fucking level that like we get to now that we don't even come close to how drunk they were back then. Like every day, half a quart of fucking whiskey a day. They're drinking with every meal. So maybe the prohibition era helped. Prohibition started because people were that drunk all the time. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Snot slinging, buck snorting, flip your dick out drunk. So Mary Kelly was found when the rent man showed up to collect her rent and he couldn't get her to open the door. So he smashed the door in and found a very grisly scene indeed. Mary was entirely naked on the bed. Her breasts, her belly, and the tops of her thighs had been completely removed. And her abdomen was literally an empty pit. Her entire throat had been removed, revealing the spine that attached her head to her torso. Many of her organs were laid around her on the bed, but the flaps were found on a nearby table. So her being naked really wasn't that outrageous. Imagine she was clothed like that. That'd be a lot weirder. <laughs> yeah, like he went underneath her clothes, cut her titties off, but like she's still wearing all her fucking. Yeah. So her being naked isn't the most outrageous part of it. Like deflated bra. Yeah. <laughs> uh, her face had been entirely slashed, and her nose, ears, eyebrows, and cheeks had been removed. Her lips were still there, but they were covered <sighs> in vertical slices. Her arms and legs had also been thoroughly slashed. There are several more victims who are speculated to have been murdered by Jack the Ripper, but for reasons related to location, brutality, or time, they are not linked definitively to the killer. Those victims are Martha Tabram, who was found stabbed to death in August of 1888, just a few weeks before Marianne Nichols was murdered. Rose Milet, who was found strangled in December of 1888. Some authorities believe she actually wasn't murdered at all, but had accidentally hanged herself by her dress collar while drunk. (laughs) <laughs> uh, haven't we all drinking and dressing alice mckenzie who was stabbed to death in july of 1889 a zigzag had been carved on her stomach but the wound was superficial and hesitant and jack the ripper had been inactive for several months by then 
In September of 1889, a mutilated torso was found beneath a railway arch, but it was too difficult to determine if the torso was consistent with the Ripper killing, with the Ripper killings, and uh, her, her dismemberment was out of pattern. And finally, Frances Cole, who was also found underneath the railway arch, her throat was cut, but there was no mutilation on her body. There have been over a hundred suspects in this case in the last 150 years, but we still do not know who Jack the Ripper really was. Many sources report, and some people believe, that the Ripper was confirmed to be Aaron Kosminski, the 23-year-old barber who was a suspect at the time because of DNA testing on a shawl found near Catherine Eddowes. However, this was debunked. The method of testing that they used was for ruling out suspects, not identifying them, and there is no proof that this shawl was in fact collected from the Eddowes crime scene. Oh, <laughs> that feels very loose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, like when you, it's, it's like in maths when you get the minus and the plus wrong and go the wrong way. Oh, ruling people out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, honestly, it'll never be solved just because there's not enough proper chain of custody, shit like that, that happens today. Like, you can't you can't take any of that evidence and make it into a real case nowadays. You could just speculate and it's fun. That's all. Uh, poor girls never find out who killed them, but it's about 100 and some years ago, so I think we're good. We'll you know? pardon them posthumously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's okay. I forgive you, Jack the Ripper. There you go. No, I said we'll, we'll pardon them, not him. Oh, I'm going to pardon him. Why not? Hey, okay, fine. He's pardoned. <laughs> we get it, man. <laughs> Times are tough. <laughs> Who's ready for question four? Question four, hit me. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Question four. This killer used to spend his time responding to Lonely Hearts ads in the newspaper, regaling women with his weird sexual appetites and pretending to be a Hollywood producer. Oh my God, I'm going to sound so smart. Uh... Tally and Bo, do you have your answer? Yes, I do. And this is me. I am saying the answer this time because I believe it is Rodney Alcala. Sweetheart, no. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> damn it. God damn it! Well, Tally, you really, you set me up! <laughs> Richard and Justin, do you have your answer? Harvey Weinstein? <laughs> I have no clue who used to pretend to be a Hollywood producer. I don't know. Yeah. Wait, did you do, have, we, have you done him, Celeste? Not physically, obviously. I mean, done a podcast. Have we covered Rodney Alcala on the show? No. No, the person that you're talking about. No, we haven't oh. covered any of these guys on the show. We haven't covered any serial killers except for Peter Lunden and Picton, but that was Patreon. That other dickhead too, that uh, changeling one, the guy that killed all the oh, right. chicken coop mooters or Eight man. Yeah, we did cover eight man. Eight man, yeah. All right, first hint. He was a fan of correspondence in general. He sent letters to one of his victim's parents describing what he had done to her. <gasps> oh, what's that guy's name? Oh, Joseph James D'Angelo. No. Oh, he. Oh, what was that guy's name? Dennis Rader. No, it's that fucking guy that he's on a bus. It's a uh, a woman that. Um, no. Oh. There's only one one woman. Hint number two, in addition to being a sadist and a cannibal, he was also a raging masochist. The fish? Albert Fish. It's Albert Fish. Oh, it's just about to fuck. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now that I'm... Shut up, Justin! Oh, for fuck's sake. For a bonus point, what was his disturbing euphemism for the penis and testicles of his victims? Jingle and bells. Nope. Uh, uh, Bindle and Pack. No. Uh, <laughs> Smith and Weston. <laughs> fucking dink and fucking nuts. No. Um, um, Holly and Jolly. Twigs uh, and berries. Dingle and dorks. Uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Nuts and balls. Cock and balls. <laughs> Richard, you're going with what you would call it. <laughs> John G- uh, uh, Larry, Larry, Pain. No, Geen. Damn it, the Geener. No, no. 
Geener and Peters. A Geener? A Geener was after Ed Gein killed a bunch of people. Back in Plainville, they started making jokes about it, and they were called Geeners. Well, listen, I have no idea. This is fun. That's just a fun fact about Ed Gein. Ham and eggs! No, but keep that keep that in mind. That is disgusting. Pork and beans. No. Okay. Bacon and bacon and chook. No. Uh, bacon and bit. Sausage Pol- and link. Pol- Links. Poultry and pig. No. Linkage. <laughs> Sausage linkage. No. Peter Skeeter. Peter Skeeter. <laughs> he called them the monkey and peewees. I would have literally never gotten that. Not in a million years. That's why it's trivia, not guess the word. Monkey and punky. <laughs> Monkey. All right, no bonus points for anyone on that. So far in this game, we have one bonus point rewarded out of four. Yay! Fuck. You guys are awesome. Oh, God. Superstars. You get the whole goddamn sheet. No, 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 I'm wrong. Two out of eight. Okay. Another interesting fact about Albert Fish, he was known throughout his hunting grounds as the Boogeyman, since he was seen by other children when he abducted his victims. The name stuck after a three-year-old boy told the police that the Boogeyman took his friend. Oh my god! That pisses me off. Because, of course, they're not going to be believed. Calling him that. Hamilton Fish was born on May 9th, 1870, to a gold lady mother and a geriatric father. As a child, he was bullied at school for being named Hamilton, and the other kids would call him Ham and Eggs. Bonus points. Bonus points! Come on! Man. Because of the bullying, he decided to take his dead brother's name, Albert. Mm. Unsurprisingly, his decrepit old father died when he was five, which meant that Hamilton and his siblings needed to be dumped at the orphanage. It wasn't so bad, though. Sure, there was heinous physical abuse, but as it turned out, he was really into that. When Albert was 12, he met his first great love, a local telegraph boy who taught him to drink piss and eat shit. Taught him to do that or to say that? To do that. Eat shit as in... As in eat shit. Like Uh, shit? Like shit. Put it on a plate, get a fork? Eating it, shit, and then eating it. Wow, that sounds like a dog. Why would you want to learn that? Why indeed? He was okay. just being taught it at four years old. He was 12. Whatever, <laughs> same diff. No, not so much. <laughs> How do people eat shit and not die? Oh, I know. Remember the, yeah. Isn't that the big E. coli thing? Everybody was getting sick from eating hamburgers that, you know. I. Oh, he definitely had hand, foot, and mouth disease. I bet you he wasn't healthy. I don't think he was healthy, Justin. I don't honestly, if you're eating shit like that, and it depends on what you're doing it. Like if it's every meal, you're just re-eating all the shits. I'm sure you would die. But if you had a, like a, like it was a Saturday night snack to you, you know, Saturday night, we're going to go. So it's just a, a child party shit. thing. As long as you're not re-loafing, everything's all right. Re-loafing. You're going with adding shit eating to a well-balanced diet. Yeah, I mean, I, I got a bad diet. I'm thinking I might. Well, never mind. <laughs> I'm gonna regift myself for yeah. the gift I gave myself. <laughs> Use those uh, vitamins I didn't take. Yeah. So yeah. When mm-hmm. you say eat eat little shit, I thought you meant drink piss as in drink alcohol. Or are you saying that he drank literal piss and ate literal shit? That is what I'm saying. Ray, all right, and that's what he his great love of his life taught him. He went, come here my 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 lover my friend come here i would like to show you let me introduce you to a smorgasbord and open you up to a new world absolutely not he smacked him around first because he was into that right gotcha yeah after their relationship unfortunately fell apart albert took to watching boys undress in local bathhouses and got his first job as a prostitute When he wasn't putting in his work hours, he took to raping young boys. That was put on hold, though, when at age 20, his mother had arranged for him to marry an 11-year-old girl. That's the most fucked up part of it all. Well, Well, at least he doesn't have to do the work of, like, finding a girlfriend. His mom just helped him out. No, well, he's out there busy doing what he loves. And, you know, when they say you do what you love, you'll get paid for it. Like, it's not work. No, he's doing it for both, a hobby and for a job as a prostitute. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, but then he had to get married and that ruined everything. <laughs> doesn't it always? Not it doesn't it. <laughs> I'm yep. uh, In 1917, his <laughs> wife left him for one of their boarders. But during the marriage, Albert uh, worked as a house painter and they had six children who she left with him when she took off. He also got side work molesting young boys. On one of his mm. dates, he visited a wax museum where he saw a bisected ding dong, which gave him the hornies for sexual mutilation. Fine. Yeah, it's like if you get off by eating shit, like there's all, the only way to go up is just like mutilation and stuff like that. Like it just escalates. So at least he went home to wax off. Uh... <laughs> In 1910. He took his 19-year-old boyfriend to an abandoned farmhouse where he torched him for two weeks before cutting off half his penis. He wanted to kill and eat his boyfriend, but he was worried that it would take too long to get home and the meat would spoil in the sun. So instead, he poured peroxide over the wound, covered it in Vaseline, dressed it with an abandoned farmhouse rag, and handed him a $10 bill. And it's unclear what happened to him after this. (laughs) Thank you for your note. Here you go. <laughs> keep the tip. <laughs> and not to mention the peroxide did literal nothing. It didn't do nothing. It hurt like hell. I mean, it killed the bacteria for the time being, but then he layered it in another layer of bacteria that probably already had maggot eggs in it. Well, let's be honest. He didn't have to do anything. So that was a kindness for Robert Fish. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. a doctor. Yeah. Neither am I. <laughs> he wasn't a cop doctor. He was a cop doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? So after his wife left, Albert went through a particularly dark period where he underwent psychiatric evaluation several times, but he was always found incorrectly sane and sent home. During their time alone with their father, his children were reportedly asked to hit him with a nail-studded paddle regularly, and they were served raw meat as Albert prepared himself to experiment with cannibalism. What the fuck? In court, his stepdaughter from his very brief second marriage claimed that Albert would play games with the kids that had undertones of masochism and child molestation. I don't think that's undertones. I think that's overtones. I think there's many many tones. (laughs) Lots and lots of tones are in there. Oh, just oh, wait. He does so much worse. But he was described as happy by his neighbors because he always had a shit-eating grin. Yeah. Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. Oh, my God, yes. The puns never end. Oh, God. Just in the Ripper, everybody. Ripper? I don't even know her. Wrecked them. I killed them. <laughs> uh, shut up, Justin. Too much. All right. mute. Muting now. No, don't do that. It ruins the recording. Can't you just shut up? There's this mute function on your fucking head. It's called closing (laughs) your mouth. (laughs) I'm sorry. That was rude. That was funny as fuck. (laughs) Justin, you've been nothing but a great partner. And I want to know. I want to know. I'm going to share the glory of this win with you. I'll give you a cuddle. All right. Um... So Albert claimed he murdered several people during the time when he was alone with the kids but none of them were ever confirmed. By 1924, Albert believed that God wanted him to torture and murder children. So he made two unsuccessful attempts to lure and murder children, Mm -hmm. at which point he dedicated himself to being the best damn child hunter he could be. Oh, look, he's got commitment. I hate Albert Fish so much. In 1928, while he was cruising the Lonely Hearts ads, he found an ad from a young man seeking work to help with the financial struggles of raising a young family. He showed up at their home, appearing to be a normal old man looking for help around the homestead. He offered Edward Budd $15 a week for his labor, and the Buds were ecstatic. They agreed that Albert, who called himself Frank Howard, could return a week later to collect his intended victim, Edward. But what Albert did not expect was that when he returned, he would meet their daughter, Grace. He became so captivated with her that he convinced the Bud family that his niece was having a birthday party and that he'd like Grace to attend. The Bud family, who probably couldn't afford a lot of fun activities for their little girl, thought it was a great idea for her to go off with this old man who could afford $15 a week and therefore probably attended very swank birthday parties. Grace never returned home again. But in November of 1934, six years later, the Buds received a letter. 
The letter recalled the day that they had spent together when he met Grace and what he had done to her after he'd taken her home. The letter said that he'd strangled her and then ate her and he made a point of telling the buds that she died a virgin. Oh, good. As long as you just ate her. I don't know why it feels better. I don't know why it feels better, but I'm just, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So um, this letter actually ended up leading to his arrest. On the envelope, they found an emblem, which was traced back to his employer and then his boarding house. Oh, what an idiot. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep. Uh, after he was arrested, he wrote disgustingly detailed letters to his attorney about his crimes. Only three victims were ever definitively linked to him. Six more were suspected to be his work, and he claimed he killed more than 100. During his trial, he pled insanity. The jurors said that they didn't doubt that he was insane, but that he should be executed all the same. Hmm. They found him to be sane, guilty, and he was sentenced to death in 1935. His death sentence was carried out via electric chair on January 16, 1936. His final words were delivered to his lawyer, who refused to read them, as it was, quote, the most filthy string of obscenities he had ever read. Uh. I wonder how long he had to be shocked to die. Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison patented, made it, and Thomas Edison, uh, his first guy he tried to kill with D- AC or whatever was like in the early 30s like that, and it took, he put it on for like four minutes, the guy survived, and they left it on for another 11 minutes after that. So that's like 15 minutes of getting shocked because they didn't know how to do it properly. They're like, next time it'll be shorter, I promise, but still, uh, I don't know, I imagine it must have taken a while to kill him because they probably didn't have it perfected yet. Who's ready for question five? Oh, yeah. All right. Question five. This killer convinced his second abducted victim to let him back into his car after accidentally locking himself out with her still inside with his gun, which he had already threatened her with. Tally and Bo, do you have an answer? Ask the guys first. Yeah. Okay. Richard and Justin, (laughs) do you have an answer? Big Ed. Big Ed Kemper. Tally and Bo, do you have an answer? Is it Lonnie Franklin Jr.? It's Edmund Kemper. Yeah, I was about to say, it's Edmund. Oh, fuck's sake. Let yeah. the guys go first. <laughs> <laughs> would it have made oh. a difference? It would have if you'd copied him. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to copy him. <laughs> what? How would we copy him if we went first? Okay, whatever. I'm, I'm done being competitive. We'll see about that. Fun. We're all having fun here. <laughs> All right, because you guys didn't need any hints, I'm going to give you two bonus points for this round if you can tell me these answers. Okay. For one bonus point, what was Ed Kemper's IQ? 146. 102. 160. Or no, 120, sorry. 155. I want to change my answer, 120. 140, 145. 167. 155, Wait, 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 Richard got it. It's 145. I knew it was high something. I, I thought it was 160, though. But I guess that was uh, Alcala was 160 because he was the only one that was smarter than Kemper IQ-wise, I think. For another bonus point, how tall was he? Six foot eight. Six four. Two six, meters six, and six, six centimeters. Seven. I'll tell you guys when you get it. Keep puking out answers. Six, six, seven, seven, six, seven, six, 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 nine. Richard got it again. He's six foot nine. I didn't know he was that big. I knew he was big, but I didn't know six nine. That's crazy. That's so scary. He's a fucking terrifying guy. All right. So Edmund Kemper <laughs> was a precocious little scamp. He liked to decapitate his sister's dolls, play fun games like electric chair and gas chamber, where his playmates would flip an imaginary switch and he would pretend to be executed and murder household pets and mount their heads on spikes. But all that boyhood boys will be boyness faded when at age 15, little Big Ed shot and killed his grandparents. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he did. Fuck you, Grandma. Like, think about being 15 and being that psycho. That's kind of, that's, it's an early life. Like, there, there's, I totally believe that killers and shit are like built by environment like it's all nurture but i mean ed kemper makes me think it's fucking nature too man because that guy was crazy from a kid on god if i killed my grandma she'd come back and beat the fuck out of me (laughs) his dad was a dick and his mom didn't want him no you're right and i think it is i think there's part of it but i also think that like 
a lot of people are like that and a lot of people don't uh turn into murders and him he turned into the one of the craziest psychos and he started really early so like is that right in you too plus the nurture like i just like to lean on the nurture side of things for and he got killers. big fast right oh fuck yeah i bet you at 15 he was six foot six you know when he was four he was a full head above his peers do you know if at uh at grade four or what, how old did you just say when he was four years old did he have the mustache too at four yeah he did <laughs> <laughs> but he had bad eyesight uh, probably just fucking pop bottles goddamn eddie so um he had a close relationship with his father as a boy but when he was nine his parents separated he was forced to stay with his overbearing abusive possibly mentally ill alcoholic mother clarnell when he was 14, he finally ran away from home and went to stay with his father. He was devastated to learn that his father was now remarried with a stepson. His father sent him to live with his paternal grandparents. And Edmund said that his grandfather was senile and that his grandmother was constantly emasculating him and his grandfather. Ed frequently got into explosive arguments with his grandmother and eventually one argument led to him grabbing his grandfather's 22 caliber rifle and shooting his grandmother in the head. He then went and shot his grandfather as he was walking up the driveway. When the police asked him why he killed his grandmother, he said he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill grandma. It gives me shivers because my kids are like, my oldest is 11 now. I believe, you know? I also believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Celeste, that he sat on his front steps waiting for his grandfather to arrive from grocery shopping or farming or whatever he was doing. He said that he killed his grandfather so that he wouldn't have to find out he lost his wife. So he did wait for him to come home. So shot him before he could even go in the house. Mm -hmm. Tender mercy. Mm -hmm. It was a mercy. It was very nice of Ed, actually. That's what he said. Yeah. So, Didn't you say that he had dementia? He was senile. His Ed said, but that's a matter of perspective. He's 14. Being a little forgetful is natural with old age. He may have just been like, this old man moves so fucking slow. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah okay yeah uh so ed was sent to the criminally insane unit of the atascadero state hospital where he stayed until he was 21 after his release in 1969 he moved back in with his mother and got a job working in the department of transportation while he worked he noticed that women were hitchhiking all over the place and he started picking them up to try to have conversations with people his own age he said that he picked up more than 100 women without an incident, but that while part of him was wondering what it would be like to ask her out, the other part was wondering what it would be like to put her head on a stick. Oh. He's trying to make friends. Mm -hmm. huh? Yep, putting himself out there. Bold, brave, yep. noble. Yep. Admirable. Have you ever had murderous thoughts? Not that you're going to kill someone, but just like, I could push you off the edge yes. of this building or something. Well, you know? I mean, that's call of the void, right? That's something that's sort of involuntary that everybody experiences. But have I thought about Intrusive murdering thoughts. somebody yes mm. yeah me too uh, and i think that he just is being honest about that part of it but i think that's normal i think like but him fan him him whatever fantasizing about killing his grandparents like people who were taking care of him at the time like i can understand fantasizing wanting to like kill your really horrible boss or an abusive ex or someone who just torments you constantly right yeah I, I wasn't mean like yeah for sure the people your enemies for sure imagine murdering them but i'm talking about like no it's not normal i i don't mean normal <laughs> i don't know how to say it it's just when you're in a car with a girl being like i could ask you how to murder you right now you have those thoughts a lot do you yeah that's how yeah. i met my wife she was the first woman who i didn't wonder it would be like to kill she no, she was the first one who listened to me when I said, if you don't marry me, I will murder you. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, only took, it only took seven years. <laughs> of murdering others. I mean. Uh, so finally in 1972, he picked up two university students and he decided that tonight was the night. He brought them to a wooded area intending to rape them, but he panicked and stabbed and choked both of the women to death. He then took the bodies to his house, being stopped by a police officer on the way for a broken taillight, but talking his way home. And now that he was relatively safe at home with his victims, he raped the bodies, dismembered them, and disposed of them in a ravine. At least he didn't oh. eat their shit. 
Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's already one step up above fish. He's not fucking... So his murder spree continued after these two victims. His third victim is the one who let him back into the car. She won't, she won't make that mistake again. She <laughs> missed the bus on her way to a dance class, I believe it was. She was 15. Her name was Aiko Ku. And he offered her a ride. She got in. He showed her his gun to mm-hmm. take control of the situation. He got out to get something from his trunk and locked her inside with the gun. Oh. And convinced her to let him back in the car. What? Convinced her? She let him back in the car. Why wouldn't she just shoot what? him? Take the gun and shoot him. She didn't. One, one, I'll give you the answer. 15. Not smart enough to think about it. Just stupid uh-huh. kid survival instincts though they they can take hold pretty quick my daughter's 14 she would have blown his fucking brains out things change yeah. when you're in that sort of hot and uh... well that's true and does she know how to work the gun does she even know how to fire the damn thing or take the safety off if there was one well he's out he's outside the car it wouldn't matter she has all the time in the world to figure it out ah. plus he's a fucking giant and he's like intimidating he said that from looking at her, it didn't even occur to her that the gun was there. Uh, of course. Oh. Of course. So she didn't even say it. Because she was... She saw it. She knew that he showed it to her, but she she forgot that it was there in her, the moment. Her ideals were to survive, not to hurt anyone. Yeah. It may also be a cultural thing. She was from a different ethnicity. So, um... Big Ed was very charming and amicable when dealing with people, so much so that he befriended several police officers during his killing spree who called him Big Ed. They knew him well. In 1973, he committed three more murders of college students that he picked up, strangling them, raping them, and then killing them. But in April of 1973, Kemper was in yet another battle with his mother, and this time he'd had enough. After she went to sleep, Ed bludgeoned her with a claw hammer decapitated her and did unnatural things that involved her mouth on his pb is is a claw hammer the one that's like rounded that's a ball peen hammer the claw hammer has <laughs> like a right when you think of a hammer that's a claw hammer oh like the part that takes the nails out you got it yeah that's the claw that is yeah. awful yeah and you just said that was april 73 and he'd already killed three people that year so he's super escalated he's up to like one a month uh and i don't know how far you're gonna go with this so i have more comments but yeah ed fucked his mom's mouth hole when her head was decapitated so scary guy well in fairness she she was hammered so Uh Ah! so after he had weird mouth sex with his mom's head he used the head as a dartboard cut out the tongue and larynx and screamed at it for an hour is this (laughs) is this his own accord yeah this is what he said is. he felt it fitting because she screamed at him all the time so he, he cut out the way that she her talked turn. and then he yelled at her head for a long lord time. alive yeah. i imagine she probably never let him speak so this was the time he was like now i get the final say bitch he just left all these like one-liners and put wrote them all down until he got there and then he's just like all right back in uh, back in april you said this and then just screams all the answers back yeah good job mate there's a lot of things about her mouth a lot of things about her mouth Ah. but who says what about his it has a very nice mustache i'll rip it off his face now it's nice leave it alone uh after the murder of his mother he concocted a plan to cover his tracks he invited a friend of his mother's over killed her and then stole her car He planned to establish his alibi, saying that his mother went on vacation with her friend, but instead he left both bodies in the house and kept on driving to Colorado. While he was there, he felt his purpose had been fulfilled, but he also felt guilty about what he had done. He watched the TV, waiting for the news to break, but it never did. So Ed Kemper went to a phone booth, called the police, turned himself in, and waited to be picked up. Before he was yeah. convicted, he attempted suicide twice and asked to be given the death penalty, but it was but he was ultimately sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences. So he is currently 72 years old and he contributes to the prison by working with psychotic inmates. Yeah, he also said later in life that if he just would have killed his mom right away, he could have saved like seven other people's lives. Yeah, I'd heard that too. Yeah, so he he 
he was just a confused young man who hated his parents. He probably should have just killed his mom. Saved some lives. I find it crazy that he killed his grandparents and then got out again to kill more. No one was watching him. You figure they'd be like, you killed some people. Maybe we should watch you for a couple of years. It didn't take long before he started murdering. So, But he was so nice and polite. Yeah, and his mom worked for the university, right? So he had all like the university stickers and shit. And he looked like just a regular student there. So he wasn't suspicious enough. But I mean, you murdered your grandparents. You figure you'd be a suspect all the time. Yeah. Who lives around here? Oh, this guy who killed his grandparents? Maybe we should look into him for these all these fucking girls dying. But they never did. Yeah. Yeah, and nobody remembered, like, you know, the Department of Transportation vehicle picking people up everywhere. Like, yeah. it was weird, for sure. But... Yeah. And nobody noticed a guy who's six foot nine. He's huge. Well, there's also like the other stuff going on at the same time, right? It wasn't just Eddie killing people around that time in that area. It was like the Manson shit was going on. Uh, uh, who else? There's other serial killers active at the same time. So it made it a lot more hefty on the police force. Interesting, dude. You got more on Eddie? Because I got a couple of things I want to say if possible. Nope. I like how he, he narrates. He narrates books. That's fun. Like in in prison people buy his voice <laughs> okay i just want to mention we're doing a lightning round so like oh just be careful with blowing the wad on potential trivia answers blow yeah, your wads richard blow your wads not what do you, got, what you not gotta say wads. nothing i got a big fat wad staying to myself he's got a beautiful voice and like <laughs> he hasn't killed anyone in like 50 years relax <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hello, this is Edmund Kemper. I'll be resorting love poetry by Lord Byron. <laughs> Tonight's selection, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. <laughs> this killer wanted his ashes spread in the Cascade Mountains of Washington mm. State after his death sentence had been carried out. Sally and Bo, do you have an answer? Ted fucking Bundy. Yeah, it's Theodore. Theodore Bundy. All right, for bonus point, was his request ever fulfilled? No. No. Uh, I... Wrong. It absolutely was. His ashes and all of his living possessions were given to his attorney who spread his ashes over the mountains in Washington, where four of his victims were buried. What a piece of shit. Fuck that lawyer, for sure. Like, he was a guilty motherfucker. How dare you? Still a person. <gasps> Another interesting fact about Ted Bundy. In the end, his downfall as far as physical evidence were bite marks he left on the victims being matched to his bite impressions, a science which has since been ruled inadmissible. No kidding. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, bite mark bite mark evidence is fucking gone. It's the gone the way of the lie detector. Why? It's... Because because the bite okay so if i understand correctly it's because the way that a bite mark works the impression is going to be changed based on a variety of factors right. and so you cannot legally match it to somebody because there's just too high a risk that it's it's going to be either a, a false positive or a false negative okay um yeah so because bundy is so popular and we may cover him in a deeper episode later my summary is going to be very brief Theodore Bundy was born a unibrowed little baby on November 24th, 1946. He came into this world in a home for unwed mothers, and though his father was never identified, it is speculated that Bundy was the result of an incestuous union between his mother and his grandfather. Oh, gross. Yeah. Well, not the first one of those we've covered on this show. Mm. Uh, he was raised by his maternal grandparents, who told people that he was their son, but at some point, he did discover the truth about his mother. Bundy was troubled, but intelligent and charming. Bundy blossomed into a king among perverts. As a teenager, he would go on long walks, searching for discarded pornography and open windows. It's impossible to say when he got his big break in violent crime, but his first confirmed victim wasn't until 1974, when he was 28. Bundy did go to college, first studying Chinese and then attending law school in Utah, despite mediocre scores and an iffy attendance record. While he was in college, Bundy met his first love, and the two of them dated on and off for seven years. Bundy was planning to marry her. During their long and tumultuous relationship, his girlfriend was suspicious about his behavior and absences, but she said that he was warm and kind. 
Diane was affluent. If I was, if I'm not mistaken, she was like, uh, going to bring him into like the, being the lawyer into that kind of like higher lifestyle thing. And then she broke up with him and he was like, he lost the whole wanting to kill her like vibe. A, no, it was more like a, like he was in love with her and she, he was just like, to her was like a passing interest kind of thing. Like good looking guy, like, yeah, fling kind of thing. And they they dated for a little bit, but I, I forgot about that. That's right. He had a, like that weird girlfriend that was, I think, a lawyer's kid or something. She's yes, rich, and rich the girl. the brown hair parted down the middle. Yeah. Thing. What did I say? Um, okay, so she broke off their engagement in January 1974, at which time women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest. His victims were always young, attractive college women and women who resembled Diane. He would use a ruse to abduct these women, faking a limp to get help to his car or impersonating police officers. And once he got them to his 1968 tan Volkswagen Beetle, he would handcuff them or bash them over the head with a crowbar to incapacitate them and then abduct them. Once he had a victim, he would rape them, sometimes repeatedly, strangle or bludgeon them, and then mutilate the bodies after death. He also liked to keep their corpses and decapitated heads in his home, sometimes in his bed, sometimes having sex with them, until he couldn't bear the smell. Ew. And then he would re- he would frequently revisit the dumping grounds to relive his kills. Fucking ew. <sighs> yeah. We all get lonely. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't know how a lot of this stuff comes from him later after when it just like weeks before he fucking gets executed. And like, I find... Like, did he do half the shit? Maybe. Or is he just trying to piss off the cops even more? Or is he trying to, like, hold back some information so he can, like, get rid of his death sentence and just go life in prison? I don't know. I don't know how much. Bundy's a fucking full of shit. He's the biggest bullshitter there is out of all of them. So I don't know what he, what's true and what's not with this fucking asshole. Did he go back to the place and fuck the bodies? That's what he said later on. Did he actually do that? I don't know. Uh, during his active period, many people called into the police to report Bundy as the man they were looking for, but police would repeatedly let him go because he seemed like an upstanding guy. In fact, he evaded incarceration several times before he was finally nailed down, claiming more victims each time he escaped their grasp. He ended up on police radar after fleeing a patrol car and being found in possession of several murdery items, and he was arrested after one of his victims escaped after being kidnapped and sexually assaulted. In my neck of the woods. Two miles that way. Okay. Man's right. Uh, In court, Bundy represented himself using his years of law school, and the judge said that if he hadn't been such a dickbag, he would have made a pretty good lawyer. That is such bullshit. (laughs) That is such bullshit. How did he get incarcerated if he was such a good lawyer? Uh, Bundy was sentenced to death for 30 murders, and he was executed via electric chair on January 24th, 1989, at age 42. So one of our youngest to die. Buzz, buzz, motherfucker. My son ordered a shirt off eBay that says, Burn Bundy Burn. He wears it around with pride. I had a client, and it was uh, actually Debbie Kent's dad, and he was the sweetest guy in the world. But you could tell that having gone through the trauma that he'd gone through that oh god i i can make jokes about a lot of shit i can't make a lot of jokes about ted bundy oh that's a that's a that's a big scar around this neck of the woods yeah i don't blame you man it's uh they were all daughters to somebody yeah yeah and and yeah meeting somebody that was actually i got nothing after that no you're good you know what we the vulnerability we appreciate it's okay to be vulnerable on the show as well we're not here we're not here to be funny like we're just here i'm here to be funny (laughs) bundy's a fuck knuckle we've said this several (laughs) times on this show yeah The only thing I the only thing I gotta say about Bundy is whenever you say he's good looking, there's two things I have to say about that. He's got a fucking unibrow, he's not good looking, and he fucking went and raped dead bodies. He's not good looking. Shut up. F- quit forgetting um, that he was a piece of trash. He was like one of the worst. He ones was 38 far, and literally looked 58. Yeah, he sucks. Agreed. Also, he's way over covered, and I'm sick of his story, and he's not interesting. Yeah. yeah. Fuck that guy. He's dead in the ground. But I would be remiss to do a serial killer episode and not talk about Bundy because he is the most searched serial killer. Really? 
He is by far. Well, in the research for your uh, episode, come down to Salt Lake. I'll show you some stuff. I would actually love to come down to Salt Lake. A lot of fucked up shit has happened there. I'd like to see Nutty Putty Cave. I'd like to see um, the, uh, whatchamacallit? The fucking Mormons. The Mormons. Um... <laughs> yeah, there's like seven of them around here somewhere. <laughs> I bet. I'd like to see lots of stuff. I want to see. I want. I want to see the G spot. Virgil showed us on the thing. That's in Salt Lake. I don't know what that is. The G spot. I believe you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, there was a bar across Ooh, the street. Bird! <laughs> <laughs> One day. There was a bar across the street from the University of Utah called Big Ed's for a while. For a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Coincidence, I'm sure. A lot of bad shit happens in Utah. Like it's a lot of bad shit happens. It is actually creepy. It's like a it's like a a lightning rod for bad shit. Yeah. Who's ready for Kelly number seven? I let's go. All right. Yeet yeet. This killer came into the world, no name Maddox. Hmm. Yeah. For those of you playing the home game, since it sounds like somebody's got the answer here, his mother once traded him for a pitcher of beer, and he was once set on fire by a fellow inmate in prison. All right, frickin' Brack, what you got? Uh, it's Charles Manson. Yes! Charles Manson! I mean, <laughs> we concur. Idly. For a bonus point. What was the name of the album that inspired Manson to start the Manson family? It, Helter Skelter. That's not the album. That's a song. The White Album. Yes, it is. I would like to say the White Album. <laughs> my answer. Would you now? <laughs> At this point, I'm tempted to let you because you guys are really, really falling behind. Another interesting fact about Manson, he was almost offered a record deal, but he pulled a knife on the music producer after he was given some constructive feedback. Like he stabbed him? No, he pulled a knife on him. That is exactly the only response to constructive criticism. (laughs) Good gravy. Yeah. He he was actually like in the studio recording an album, not just offered one, like in there. Who didn't uh, pat down this, this man? It was oh, 1969, buddy. 60. Yeah. They, they didn't pat down anyone. They were they were like, did Charlie bring the girls? And they're like, yeah. Will they suck my dick? And they're like, yeah. Okay, let them have some fucking recording time now. <laughs> Post Sharon Tate? No. Pre. 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 Oh, Lord, Sharon Tate, yeah. Y'all scared the fuck out of me. Shit happened real fast post Sharon Tate. Yeah. <laughs> I think shit happened real fast pre. Not really. Did it Charles really. Manson actually kill anyone himself? All right, let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. Charles Manson was born on November 12th, 1934, to a deeply alcoholic teenage mother who refused to acknowledge him. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. I know one She's of those. She had a penchant for potatoes. What? She had a penchant for potatoes. She did. <laughs> for Terry Shivos. <laughs> She once traded Manson for a pitcher of beer. Uh, Just a picture? Just a picture. <laughs> what do you mean traded? I mean, he, she gave him to a barmaid, and that was she accepted it as payment for beer. Oh, all right. <laughs> fucked his whole life. Absolutely, he was. Um, he was described as a child who could turn from violence to charm at the drop of a hat. He began his criminal lifestyle at the age of 13 when he stole a gun from his aunt and uncle and committed an armed robbery. Following in the footsteps of his mother and uncle, who had also committed armed robbery, but they used a ketchup bottle instead of a gun. What? (laughs) This is not, this is, I'm not making this up. This happened. Genius. (laughs) These aren't smart people. They weren't. And I'm pretty sure they were all deeply inbred too. Hmm. Uh, so Manson spent a brief period of time in Boys Town, the rehabilitation center for young boys that was plugged by child actor Mickey Rooney at the time. And so this was this was like uh, a huge honor. There were articles printed in his town. Luckiest boy gets to go to Boys Town. This was this was like prison, but also like a castle. It was awesome. 
However, he escaped and decided to go on a crime spree instead, so he was sent to the Indiana School for Boys. And he spent years there being raped, beaten, and abused. Allegedly. No, not allegedly. 100% fact, yeah. This absolutely did happen. So he escaped from that school twice, and the second time he was forced to undergo psychological testing, which revealed that he was aggressively antisocial, but also very sensitive with grand ideas about love and acceptance. Oh, touristic? I wouldn't go that far. Okay. Unfortunately, in 1952, Manson decided to go from a rapey to raper, and it cost him his parole for two more years. When he, was finally in rele- when he was finally released in 1954, he dove headfirst back into the criminal activity involving pimping, robbery, and parole violation. When it came time for his final release, Manson begged to be kept in prison, finding the stability, the lack of instability in the outside world unbearable. But alas, he was given the cold hard boot. After his release, Manson traveled to California, where he intended to pursue music. And so his bizarre music and eccentric manner attracted a group of young weirdos and they began to see him as a guru and a leader. So the newly formed cult moved to the Spawn Ranch in California where the Manson family began. I love Squeaky. She's my favorite. Why? Where's she from? (laughs) That was their name? Yeah, well, they all had nicknames. Anyways, sorry. Which one was that? Linda? Linda? Linda Kasabian. Yeah. I, I'm pretty, she's the one who was like, she was like his right hand kind of. Yeah, that was, was Linda. One, yeah, she was like blowing, blowing what's his name at Spawn Ranch to like let them live there for free. And she would just go, Squeaky would just go blow him so she could live in his cottage. Like she's, she was the, she's just as bad as him, honestly. She was, the, she's the one I trust the least for sure. So during the time on the ranch, the followers underwent severe indoctrination and abuse. <sighs> The female members were forced to have sex with one another and were sent to forage for food in dumpsters. Uh, The followers would be dosed with LSD and then forced to sit and listen to him rant about how he was Jesus and they were reincarnations of those who had been persecuted by the Romans. And then he did all of this while simultaneously preaching about peace and love. Somehow, Gotta love the God complex. So part of Manson's ideology was that a race war between black people and white people was brewing in L.A. And that this war would expand into a global race war. He believed that black people, after years of oppression, would rise up and violently overthrow white people. The black people would win eventually, at which point they would turn on each other and kill each other as well. Because they are incapable of ruling they were made to serve. Oh, whoa, whoa. So his plan for the Manson family was that they were going to hide in a mine shaft with the Beatles until all the white people were destroyed and then the cult of the white people would rise up from the mines and rule over the black victors. Oh my. And you know, we've all we've all we've all thought about this. <laughs> Pretty sure I heard black people rised up and killed the white men. Yeah. yeah, no, and they were the victors. That surely did not happen. No, he's predicted this was going to happen. Oh, this is how he convinced all these dumb white girls to follow him around. Uh, that's what dumb means. Uh, they're not <laughs> <laughs> squeaky and foamy and slippery and side saddle. But yeah, hot dog know. hallway. And all of them were uh... <laughs> hall. Mailbox, Mary. (laughs) Okay, so now that we're clear, this is what he said is going to happen. That's why they're going to emerge from the mine shaft with the Beatles, and they're going to rule over all the Black people who don't know what to do, except kill each other, because they can't lead things. So uh, his intel on this future um, apocalypse came from the Beatles song Helter Skelter, and so he called the impending race war Helter Skelter. Which is also like one of the shittiest Beatles songs. Like, let's be honest. Like, why don't you pick a good song that might be fun? Like, uh, hey, Charlie, wait. I- Charles Manson was a fucking racist. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Just so we're clear, he absolutely was not. <laughs> kind of sounds like he yeah. was. I, he was not a racist. He wanted all the people to be black except him. 
all of his followers are white. There ain't no one black follower. Put it this way: a lot of co- uh, a lot of LSD slash crack fueled nights came up with this fucking whack wackadoo idea it's not like they were all straight level-headed thinking properly they were fucking lsd'd right out like acided right out every day which is not to say that that people who aren't all cracked out on lsd like have day jobs raise children don't do this shit too um i don't i don't know celeste if you were going to touch on this but there is a book um that discusses uh, the hypothesis that Manson was involved in MK Ultra, and that he was supplied the LSD through the uh, Ashbury Clinic. No, actually, uh, around that time, the MK Ultra shit—that's where they think they got all the acid from. Was the government like, yeah, people? Not everybody that was in MK Ultra was like, I was tortured. Some of the guys that were in MK Ultra were like, that was Did, fucking fun, and, and I they want didn't even know it more. And so yeah. they would figure out ways to get it, and they started spraying. It's because of the government that they spread it all around. That's why there was all the acid that got. Oh, out and and, at that and time. can you tell me which government that was? The the uh, the best government in the world, the U.S. government. All right. So, um, in order to speed up the process, Manson first planned to release an album like the White Album, filled with subliminal messages to fire up the black audience. He's firing up the white audience right now. No black people are paying attention to him. Swear to God. Yeah, well. Anyway, um, he was kind of like lazy and just didn't do that. But he did seize an opportunity (laughs) shortly thereafter. The Manson family had ripped off a black drug dealer. So Manson shot him and was going to use it as fuel to unite the blacks against the whites. But this man ended up surviving. Their next step was to go to the home of Gary Hinman, a political activist. And a member of the Manson family killed him. They left messages, they left the messages, political piggy and a black panther paw on the wall to fire up the whites against the blacks this time. This also did not work. And so they decided to think bigger. They were going to kill rich white celebrities and frame the black panther movement. So Manson sent four members of the Manson family to the home of Roman Polanski. So uh, before they entered the home, they first murdered Stephen Parent, an unfortunate bystander who had come across them cutting the telephone lines to the house. Once inside, they patrolled and rounded up the four occupants of the house and brought them all into the lounge. A screenwriter, whose name I don't know how to pronounce, Wojcik Frakowski. Wojcikowski. Wojcikowski. It's Frakowski. Frakowski. Oh. But his name is like Wojcik. Uh, and his girlfriend, Abigail Folger, were both stabbed to death while trying to escape. Sharon Tate was then tied to hairstylist Jay Severing, her former lover, by the neck. The Manson family shot Severing, or Sebring, as he berated them about their treatment of a pregnant woman, goddammit. Uh, so they, they shot him as, like, while he was still attached to Sharon Tate by the neck. So he's, like, just dangling from her neck at the moment. And then they stabbed him several times. <clears throat> Sharon Tate was then stabbed 16 times, killing her. Before they left, the Manson family left the Panther propaganda all over the scene. So the following day, the Manson family went out again, and this time Manson joined them. Manson believed that they had been too sloppy and wanted to show them the proper way to brutally murder people and frame minorities. <laughs> They found the home of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca, and they stabbed both of them to death. They left several messages in blood referring to Helter Skelter and carved war into Leonard's stomach. The police didn't connect the two murders, but the Manson family was arrested a few days later after they were caught vandalizing in Death Valley National Park, and Manson himself was arrested a few weeks later for stealing cars. While they were in jail, the family members would not shut the fuck up about their crimes, which led them to being charged with the murders. Manson, as well as three members of the family, were tried and sentenced to death in 1971, but after the death penalty was abolished in the state of California in 1972, the family members were eligible for parole. None of them were ever released. He's a piece of shit. Uh... That's really all I have to say. Tex, I think Tex Watson's the fucking scariest one out of all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Charles gets all the flack overall from the whole thing. 
uh, because he was such a vocal douchebag. But Tex is the scary one. Fuck, he killed them. Like, he went there. Like, anyway, like, he's fucking scary. I don't know what you have in your lightning round, so I don't want to get too much into it. But I have a couple classmates who, like, had an obsession with Charlie Manson. And I'm like, y'all need to literally grow up, is what I told them. Charlie Manson was an aesthetic for a while. I don't really care what he was. It, I killer number eight. Who's ready? Yeah, born ready. All right. This killer attempted to escape prison in 1993 by inserting a handcuff key, a ballpoint pen, a syringe, and a sticker that said "I love chocolate" into his ass. Freaking frack, you're up. Are we freaking frack? Or are they freaking frack? You guys are freaking frack. How could you even ask? Oh, we're the who twins. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to say Ridgeway for fun because we don't know. All right, you're wrong. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Richard Ramirez. Did you Google that? No. That was my idea. I'm beginning to think they may have Googled it. It was my idea. I told (laughs) Bo to say it. Why would I know? Why would I know the answer? Anyway, they're right. So for a bonus point, Richard Ramirez was tied to crime scenes due to his very uncommon footwear. What kind of shoes were his rare shoes? Flip-flops. Crocs. Avias. Man's correct. All right. Well, Tally, uh, since you hate this guy so much, the good news is we're going to be talking about him for several minutes. So, yay. Talk about his teeth. Richard Ramirez was born February 29th, 1960 in Texas. His childhood was straight out of a textbook on how to engineer a serial killer. His father was an abusive drunk who would tie Ramirez to a cross in a cemetery at night as punishment. And Ramirez spent most of his time with his cousin, Mike, a war veteran who would boast about torturing and killing enemy soldiers and raping and murdering civilians in Vietnam while teaching Ramirez military skills. Dramatic childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, His cousin Mike was eventually sent to prison for murdering his wife in front of 13-year-old Ramirez. And Ramirez then moved in with his older sister and her husband. Guess what? Her husband also fucking sucked nads. He was a peeping Tom who would take the young Ramirez on his jaunts about the neighborhood. I feel like my teeth are falling out just talking about this guy. I feel like my nads are getting sucked. What? I feel like my nads are getting sucked. Okay. Well, she, sa- she said the <laughs> guy suck nads. He does? Oh, he sure does. Good for him. Yeah, I know. Sure, it was good for his teeth. Yeah. So at some point, Ramirez got really into LSD and devil worshipping, and his fantasies turned to home invasion and murder. He committed his first murder in 1985. He ambushed 22-year-old Maria Hernandez outside of her home by banging on the hood of her car and shooting her through the window. He then went inside her home and shot 34-year-old Dale Okazaki. Dale died, but Maria Hernandez survived after the bullet ricocheted off the keys she held up to protect her face. No shit. Oh, no way. That's cool. That is one in a million. Do you know how little a key is versus how little a bullet head is? I've never seen a key before. What? Are, what? Are... I love you both. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, shut the hell up. No. <laughs> oh, I love guns. Me too. So I can see where your conservativeness comes from, but don't worry, your guns aren't being taken. Don't worry, your guns aren't being taken. Like, what was that? Yeah. We will just make ammunition unaffordable. You can make your own ammunition very, very simply. No, we're not teaching them how to make bullets. We're not teaching them how to make bullets. No, no. I'm teaching a man. You're not teaching the listeners how to make bullets. Yes. Celeste, Celeste has got the face on. that If you don't stop trying to tell people how to make bullets, she's going to come down there and belt you, so stop it. Come on, I have a bunch of food already made for you, like chicken wings. I got garlicky green beans. I made way too much rice. Oh, I'm on a diet because of high blood pressure, and I'm not allowed to eat anything that tastes good. That's my diet. So, who's pl- who's playing a guitar? Sounds like a fucking ukulele to me. It's me. Okay, so, um, I just wanted one solo in my life. <laughs> 
<laughs> Zoom just showed up with a pop up that said, "Playing music, set up professional audio." <laughs> Apparently, this is music <laughs> according to Zoom. I thought that was actually you strumming. Auto tune that shit. All right. So within an hour of this attack, Ramirez attacked again. He ambushed thirty-year-old Siai Sat, and he pulled her out of the car, and he shot her several <laughs> times. <laughs> Attacks and then that's my daughter's name on you uh and shot her several times before fleeing she was found alive but she did end up dying at the scene yeah yes i silent 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 i don't know what it is man yeah that chick anyway so three attacks in one night not bad for a first timer i don't think he was a first timer at this point but keep on so um what do you mean not what do you mean not a first timer this was this was his first attacks officially Officially. i know that's what i mean i just i don't think he i think he had i don't know i i don't know i just from what i know about him i don't believe that's where he he may have done stuff before that's not known to the rest of the world just because you don't usually start with that crazy like on the middle of the street shooting people well this was his especially his past that's what i'm saying especially with his past I'm sure there was other things going on. But anyways, it's fine. I'm not saying it's bad. I like what you're writing is bad. I'm just saying from my like thought process, I doubt it's his first time doing anything. Does that mean it's true? No, that just means it's me talking. Okay, but do you or do you not believe this was his first murder? Yes. Just what I said. I said murder. Okay. So Ramirez would continue his spree with sporadic breaks in between, but often he would go out and kill each night. He preferred, or his preferred method was to break into a home and attack the people living inside. He would shoot to kill the men immediately and then restrain and sexually assault the women. However, the manner in which he killed women would change all the time, which is really unusual for a serial killer. And whether or not he would kill them also changed. Oh, uh, he's not consistent. He's scary as fuck because you would sit in your house and lay and wait for hours in a closet, wait for you to come home then kill you that's fucking scary that's scary as shit yeah fuck that i could not do that that's that's far like i couldn't do that i'd get so bored yeah because i don't think for lots of killers they have like a pattern right and they fall and they just get more and more uh progress progress but i think with him the thing that was his pattern was just like the the being a fucking scary asshole like staying in someone's house and like catching them off guard i think that was the thing that got him off not the actual murder so that's why i think he changed up so much Okay, so um, unfortunately, as much as I hate to say it, he didn't really discriminate against children too much. There were reports of him abducting children from their beds, assaulting them, and then abandoning them. That being said, uh, he didn't kill them. So there's that. He said that. What a peach. So after he killed his victims, Ramirez would make himself comfortable in the home, heading to the kitchen for a recovery beverage and a snack. Uh, according to the San Francisco Bay Area police, in one house, he ate literally everything in the fridge, threw up on the kitchen floor, jerked off on the living room carpet, and then wrote a satanic symbol on the wall and left. Oh, just an average Friday night, really. Just like a really poor house guest. <laughs> I usually never pass up an opportunity to say hail Satan because I'm uh, <laughs> down with the Dark Lord. But this fucking guy's an asshole, and I don't even want to give him his hail Satan. So he can go fuck yeah, himself. Yeah, no, he had the wrong idea of Satanism, or or the temple of or the Satanic temple. You're supposed to eat everything in the living room and jack off in the fridge. Yeah, I was about to say I I'm not a I'm not a, a person who likes to ejaculate on carpet because I'm not an animal. If I'm going to ejaculate anything, it's going to be in the fireplace, so that when it gets lit, <laughs> when it gets lit, it just smells. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if Justin is actually laughing or in serious pain. <laughs> there was a whole bunch of emotions he just went through. Wow. I feel like this takes him back. He's like, ah, ha, ha. yeah. Campfire stories. <laughs> He's like the amount of time. What? <laughs> The amount of times I've ejaculated into an open flame. <laughs> it doesn't put it out. Oh, damn. We can tell Kent that right now. One oh, man, no, that was good. one man, and one time ejaculating is not enough to put a flame out. 
All right, homework for next time. How many men would it take simultaneously ejaculating on a fire to put it out? How big is the fire? Um, yeah. let's say a campfire. A math homework. Like- we'll get to it later. We don't have time to do it tonight. Yeah, I got nothing. We'll get to it. It's fine. Actually, Christy is usually our math guy. She's the one who usually conducts our 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 semen math. As you were mentioning, Ramirez was obsessed with the occult. Gross. He would have his victims swear to Satan. He would leave pentagrams all over crime scenes and all over victims. And in court, when he pled not guilty, he raised his hand with a pentagram on his palm and said, hail Satan. That just means the werewolf will kill him next. Well, no such luck. Despite this, he never drank blood or ate human flesh, and his murders were in no way ritualistic. Coward. (laughs) Ha, bitch! (laughs) (laughs) Um, so Ramirez was almost caught twice. The first time he was pulled over for a traffic violation after an attempted kidnapping. And while the call was coming in on the radio, he fled inside the vehicle. They found a business card for a dentist's office. And so police sent two officers to stay undercover at the office until Ramirez came in after several days, he still hadn't come in. And so they installed an alarm in the office that the staff could trigger if Ramirez did come in, which he did. And the alarm failed to trigger. <laughs> so he instead got his tooth fixed by the world's most nervous dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get like why that stuff happens to serial killers. Like you hear about some guy in no, do you know what? I am not derailing this. Continue, Celeste, and I apologize. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it's because, like, you're so statistically unlikely to be a serial killer that, like, other statistically unlikely things happen to you, such as having good luck. You know what I mean? Okay, so, uh, yeah, the dentist office called the police after Ramirez had already left. Bummer. Uh, They also hit a major snag in the investigation when the dumb fuck mayor of San Francisco spilled the beans on their most useful piece of information. Diane Feinstein. Fucking Diane Feinstein. Oh. Right? So she revealed the uncommon shoes that Ramirez wore in a press conference, a detail that police were keeping on a strict need to know basis, a detail that he could be identified from, prompting him to change his shoes. She's an asshole. Did she do it deliberately? Kind of. She was, she was, she was getting pissed about how bad the city was looking. And so she was undermining the police. Yeah, she did. She totally did it on purpose, but she didn't think it would have negative. She was like trying to be smarter than the people that do that job every day, right? Just because you're the boss doesn't mean you're the smart one in this situation. Don't go to the press and go tell them the stuff they want to hold back information. There's a reason they do this, asshole. So, yeah. Despite all the hiccups, the police were able to get a a description of a tall Hispanic man with long, dark hair. And one victim that he left alive managed to get to the window and get a description of his vehicle and uh, a partial license plate. His vehicle was an orange Toyota station wagon. I don't think we can do it, guys. I don't think we can put out a bonfire with ejaculation. Um, I, think- <laughs> I was like, where's Bo gone? She's been gone for a bit. She's, she's looking up. Um, she's acting okay. like she's delivering the most horrible news to us, too. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. We can't do it. It's going to take 12,500 single ejaculations. And I just I just don't know how we're going to get that many people around a bonfire. That's a lot of synchronization, too. I just, I'm just really sorry. We just need to recruit, recruit guys who have solid distance. <laughs> Richard's like, my turn has come. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go, guys. Dribbler. Never shot, never shot my life. Okay. Okay, so the police were able to find his vehicle. And upon inspection of the vehicle, they found a fingerprint on the mirror that matched a Richard Ramirez, a drifter with a very long rap sheet. Two days later, his mugshot was broadcasted on every TV in America and every newspaper in California. That night, Ramirez was in a liquor store where shoppers saw him pick up a newspaper, see his mugshot, and take off running. <sighs> The police were called, and soon the area was swarmed with officers and a helicopter. 
Ramirez entered a Hispanic neighborhood and attempted to steal a car to escape, but the owner of the car recognized him and attacked him. Jesus, that's brave. Ramirez then ran to another car and attempted to steal it. He was able to punch the driver in the stomach and steal her keys, but she fought back hard. An 85-year-old hero, Jose, I don't know how to pronounce this, Burgoyne, ran out of his house and approached the vehicle. Ramirez threatened to shoot him if he came closer, but Jose didn't see a gun, so he kept right on coming and pulled the little puke right out of the driver's seat. Yes. (laughs) This man is 85. Take it, Ramirez. This is the best part about the whole Ramirez story is how the whole fucking town caught him i love it it's my favorite part of the story yeah so more neighbors jumped onto the scene including the driver's husband who whacked the shit out of him with barbecue utensils before <coughs> Perez managed. yes <laughs> oh yes <laughs> before ramirez managed to wriggle free and run down the block the neighbors chased him and one managed to knock him on the ground by bashing him over the head with a metal pipe yes and then as he lay on the ground, the crowd of people savagely beat him. Well, just holding him down would have been fine. <laughs> no, fuck that. Yeah, beat when him. When the police no, arrived, they literally had to force the crowd off of him before they killed him. <gasps> Ramirez was thanking the police. Oh! He was saying, it's me, it's me, I'm the guy, come take me, help! Thank you so much, yeah. literally. Ah, oh, what a little bitch. Yeah. No kidding. What a Might as well bitch. go down getting kicked. Fuck him. (laughs) Yeah, agreed. So Ramirez was found guilty of 13 counts of murder, 5 counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, and 14 counts of burglary. He was sentenced to death in the gas chamber, but he unfortunately and fortunately died from B-cell lymphoma in 2013 at the age of 53 while awaiting his turn. What is that cancer? Gas chamber. That's cancer, man. In the 21st century. Yeah, what is what cancer of? Blood, I believe. Nice. Yeah. Poison from the inside out. Question nine. Who's ready? All of us. Maybe. I am. Woo. All right. Penis. Sorry. <laughs> This killer once eloquently said, quote, I cannot help the fact that I am a murderer no more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. Ah, fuck that guy. Do poets sing? Italian Bo, do you have your answer? I believe so, ma'am. Sure. (laughs) Eric Clapton. (laughs) (laughs) It's from heaven. (laughs) Like close bam, enough, bam, but we meant Larson. La, la, oh, I think with an R. Did we? Sure. No, ma'am. Frick and frack, you're up. Andre Chicatello. Chicatilly. No, sirs. First hint. Sorry, I know who it is now. Oh well, fuck off! I didn't give you a hint. <laughs> I'm not gonna answer. Right? I was disqualified. Despite having readily yep. available access to cash, he sold his victim skeletons to medical schools. H.H. Holmes. Yes! It is. I was about to say, Richard said it before. For a bonus point, how many wives did H.H. Holmes have? Twelve. Minnie and Manny. Minnie and uh, Manny. Three. 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 Two. Three. Four. Seventeen. I said three. three. Right I know off the you bat. Did. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm telling Richard. I said twelve. Oh my god. I was way off. <laughs> I was so off. <laughs> I thought he was Mormon. Mm. Sorry. Oh. Um. <laughs> um, the most interesting fact about H.H. H. Holmes, he used a self-built murder castle to trap and kill his victims like rats in a maze. Oh. Yeah. What a clever man. Indeed. Yeah. That's what you want to call it. All right. So Herman Webster Mudgett was born in 1861. <laughs> He grew up in a wealthy home, but he was bullied in school. He once expressed that he was afraid of doctors, so his peers made him stand in front of a skeleton in a doctor's office and stare at it. Boo. (laughs) A real skeleton? Or like Mr. Bones? Back then, it was all real skeletons. They didn't have fake ones, man. They had skeletons to spare. 
So uh, Herman got married at 17 and enrolled in medical school. His background may have been very wealthy, but apparently mommy and daddy were stingy with the dough because all throughout his college years, he was body snatching for cash, either by selling cadavers or using fresh corpses for life insurance scams. During college, his wife had a child, but fortunately for her, when Herman graduated in 1884, he abandoned his family and moved to Chicago, changing his name to Henry Howard Holmes. The inspiration for his name coming from, of course, Detective Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. Did it really? I did not know that about H.H. H. Holmes. It came from Sherlock. Mm-hmm. So in Chicago, Holmes got married a second time and worked at a pharmacy, eventually buying it from the man who gave him the job. Once he had enough money from his various cons, he built a three-story building across the street from his pharmacy. He said that the first level was storefronts, the second level was residences, and the third level was going to be a hotel during the World's Columbian Expedition in May, Exposition in May 1983. The hotel portion was never built because the investors fell through. Holmes didn't have the money to furnish his project, so he would buy furnishings on credit from several vendors and then hide the items he bought from them when their collectors came and knocking. Holmes said Holmes was said to be unsettling, but also extremely charismatic and charming. So getting credit and pulling scams was not difficult, difficult for him at all. One of his creditors also mysteriously died inside his pharmacy, but it may have just been a coincidence. However, the creditor's hunt for Holmes made the newspapers. And when the investors saw the articles, they pulled out of the project. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, what was the date on that? 1884. Okay. He's, he's interesting to me. I like H.H. Holmes. You know, obscure. Like, I don't like him. I think he's a piece of shit, but I mean, I find him interesting. He is interesting. So during construction, Holmes hired several different contractors and frequently fired them. He also kept control over the full blueprints so no one on the job site could see the entire floor plans. The rabble of builders ended up unknowingly building his murder castle, complete with 51 doors that opened to a brick wall. 100 soundproofed rooms with no windows, some of which had a gas line that could pump gas directly into the room, dead-end staircases, two furnaces, secret passages, and each room had a suspiciously human-sized chute leading into the basement. (laughs) In the basement, there was an incinerator, surgical tables, and tools, as well as vats of acid and quicklime. I think back when, anyone could fit down a laundry chute. Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but like this is like wide enough that you wouldn't have to like poke it with a broom. Or cut him <laughs> up into a sludge first. How does Santa get down the chimney? Magic, magic corn. Duh. I thought it was just magic Santa dust. No, it's the corn and then he fits down the cornhole. No. Oh. You know do you know what's worse than reindeer shit on your roof? But human Santa coming down your chimney. Oh, you said, oh, yeah. Okay, so after construction finished, Holmes got married a third time in 1984. 1894. 1884. What the fuck year is it? <laughs> he got married a third time in 1884. All right, so let's check the count. Three marriages, zero divorces. Two of these wives were in Chicago. So it is believed that Holmes began killing at the end of 1891. How did I fuck up so many of these dates? <laughs> A lot to think about, man. Like, <laughs> it is believed that Holmes began killing at the end of 1891. Julia and Pearl Smythe, the wife and daughter of one of the men who worked at his pharmacy, were the first to go missing. Julia was also Holmes's mistress. Uh, His employee found out about their affair and had abandoned his wife and daughter with Holmes and to their deaths. During the later investigation into Holmes, a local man recalled Holmes paying him to strip Julia's skeleton to be sold to medical schools. Another lover of Holmes went missing a year later and then a third. It's impossible to say what really went on in the murder castle, but Holmes claimed that he would use chloroform and gas to kill his victims in the gas chambers, or he would allow them to starve as they searched for an escape, or he would burn them alive in the incinerator. 
He didn't like to get his hands dirty until after they were dead, and he was harvesting harvesting their organs for the black market or medical schools. But none of that is to say that the cons stopped. In fact, Holmes found himself a business partner working in the chemical bank, Ben Pitizel. Pitizel. Uh, after meeting Ben, Holmes met an out-of-work actress, Minnie Williams, in 1893. He offered her a job and convinced her to sign her property over to him, which he then signed over to his partner. He rented an apartment with Minnie as her husband, but they weren't married, and invited (gasps) his sister to come visit before robbing and killing them both in the murder castle. Not the sanctity of marriage. What a pig. Blasphemer. Yeah. It's one thing to marry several women, but to pretend you're married to a fourth one. Oh, that's disgusting. It's absolutely fucking disgusting. It is. He's drawn the line. I think I need to leave. This is I'm done. This is that is too far. <laughs> According to uh, Minnie's will, uh, Holmes inherited all of her possessions as her husband, even though they weren't married. Which means Don't worry about producing documents. You're okay. We believe you. <laughs> yeah. He also inherited anything that she inherited. Uh, in 1894, one of Holmes's insurance schemes was setting his home on fire for insurance money. However, he was caught and he became a wanted man in Chicago, which forced him to close up shop on his murder castle and flee to Fort Worth, where he had inherited property from Minnie's sister. He attempted to get another murder, murder castle up and running, but it would never come to be. He was jailed briefly oh. in 1894, where he met another con man before being bailed out. Holmes and his new friend concocted a plan to get a $10,000 life insurance payout by faking Holmes's death. The plan did not work, and so they decided to try again, this time with Holmes's business partner, Ben Pitizel. Holmes took him to a laboratory where he told him that he was going to leave a cadaver and set the lab to explode. However, instead, Holmes knocked him out with chloroform and then set his body on fire. Ah, tricked you. <laughs> Got him. Got him. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Psych. Classic. <laughs> oh, the old classic chloroform joke. Uh, this claim was successful, and Holmes and his new business partner were five thousand dollars richer. Nice work, Holmes. Um, after Pitizel's death, Holmes convinced <laughs> Pitizel's wife. I don't know how to say his fucking name. <laughs> That uh, Pitizel was hiding <laughs> and to give him custody of all three of Pitizel's children. Oh, little pits. Oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Three <laughs> out of five of Pitizel's children. His mother kept the mini pits. two of yeah. them. Yes, the pitlets. The three little pits. The pitlets. <laughs> the pitlets. Yes. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent work. That was really well done. Thank you. Thank you. So the three little pitlets all went missing and Holmes later confessed to locking <laughs> This murder castle was made of straw. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Holmes later confessed to locking the two girls in a trunk and pumping gas in with a hose before burying them in the cellar and he um, and using prescription drugs to kill the boy before chopping him up and burning him in a cottage fireplace. Holmes and his third wife were finally caught in Boston in 1894. He had stolen a horse in Texas and was held on an outstanding warrant by Pinkertons who had trailed him from Philadelphia. The only murder that he was charged with was for Ben Pitizel, for which he was sentenced to death. The only other victims definitively tied to him were the three pitlets, and Holmes spilled his guts to everyone who would listen but his confessions and exclamations were lies and nonsense, so it is impossible to even begin to know what really happened to him or any of his victims. He was hanged on May 7th, 1896. His neck did not break, and he strangled for 15 minutes. His request before his death was that he be buried in concrete so that body snatchers could not steal his body for dissection. The murder castle was set on fire in in 1895 and mostly destroyed, but it was restored into a post office until 1938 when it was torn down. That's where all the fucking mail that gets lost goes. Yeah. (laughs) Just down into an acid vat with a floating fucking skull beside it. He deserved everything he got. He took the little pitlets. He he made 
made the little pitlets no more. I have a problem with that. And he, he faked the sanctity, sanctity of marriage. He is a pig. Not the pitlets. <laughs> Anything but the pitlets. Not the marriage. <laughs> Uh, he could have killed over 100 people this guy he's so crazy i believe he said he killed over 200 yeah it, it, yeah but they, men always exaggerate things like that don't they don't they yeah, they do he maybe he was measuring in centimeters uh, yeah. into murders <laughs> sent to murders i like that one <laughs> no, probably milli murders yeah, <laughs> milli murders for sure <laughs> all right last one guys all right, Woo! let's do this. I have gotten a hole of donuts, right? All right, but I've learned so much. In the 1960s, this killer study film under notorious statutory rapist Roman Polanski, who taught him how to use a camera. Is it Alcala? Alcala? Yes. For a bonus point. As Rodney Alcala concluded his closing argument in which he begged jurors to spare him the death penalty, he played a portion of a song. What was that song? Helter Skelter. Stairway to Heaven. Uh, Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. (laughs) I don't know what the song is called, but it had like, uh, it was something, it was like a comedian. No, it was like a comedian doing some sort of like irony song uh what the fuck was it called Flight of the concord i don't know i let them die or kill them all or it was some fucking thing like that i can't remember what it was called though it was alice's restaurant by arlo guthrie arlo guthrie oh boy what a piece but isn't of shit there like song. a isn't there like a part where it says like kill them all kill them all kill or something like but it's ironic let them- it was it was a song let- about vietnam it was like a whiny, hippie, like, folky, shit. folky song about yeah. Vietnam, yeah. Okay. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting fact about Alcala, as you might have gathered, he represented himself in court. He even questioned himself on the witness stand in a deeper voice and then answered himself in his normal voice. He did this for five hours. Yeah. Ex- Had Bundy much? Excellent work. But he didn't do that. But he represented himself. Yeah, but he didn't talk to himself on the stand like that. No, for sure. But the thing about Alcala is, like, he was watching other killers do shit, and he was trying to, like, I don't know, let, let Celeste go, and then I'll talk. Like, yes, for sure, he represented himself, and Bundy just did that. So who is he trying to copy? Bundy. It's like, uh, same thing with Green River Killers. He was, anyways, he was mimicking these assholes just to try and get away with it. He was smart as fuck. Mm. All right, Rodney Alcala, also known as the Dating Game Killer, was born in 1943. Not a lot is known about his childhood other than that other than his father moved the family from San Antonio, Texas to Mexico when Rodney was eight and then abandoned the family a few years later. Rodney returned with his mother and his sister to L.A. When he was 17, he enlisted in the army, but after a nervous breakdown, he went AWOL and hitchhiked to his mother's house and he was sent for psychological testing. Psychologists found that Rodney had antisocial personality disorder, a common prerequisite for violent criminals. Because of his diagnosis, he was discharged, and he enrolled in UCLA School of Fine Arts. In 1968, Rodney committed his first violent crime, abducting and raping an eight-year-old girl. Tally Shapiro was walking to school when 25-year-old Rodney pulled up beside her and asked if she wanted a ride. He told her that he knew her parents, and she went with him. She said that she was uncomfortable. She said later that she was uncomfortable, but that she'd been taught to respect her elders. Unbeknownst to Rodney, a passerby had seen him invite the girl into his car. He followed Rodney and called the police when Rodney took her inside. When the police arrived, Rodney didn't open the door until they threatened to break it down, at which time he said he was in the shower. Rodney took this opportunity and escaped out the back door as the police burst in, finding Tally alive, but raped and badly beaten on the floor. So if not for that good Samaritan, she never would have survived. The attack made headlines, but Rodney had fled L.A. to New York, where he enrolled in NYU under the alias John Berger and studied film under Roman Polanski. He's a puke, too. Yeah, he is. 
Polanski is a piece of shit, but naming yourself John Berger is hilarious. Let's be honest. Like that's the most made up, made up name ever. He really, really missed an opportunity there as well. He should have called himself Hamish. So everyone would call him Ham Burger. Oh. Um, <laughs> or Idiot. Sam. Sam Burger would also be good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Max Power. <laughs> Mike Litteris. <laughs> Joy King. Bill Bill Doe. Bill Doe. Um, my favorite hunter down. <laughs> Sounds like he's eating a burger and he just went, uh, John Burger. Bur- burger, yeah, burger's my name. <laughs> Huge. I'm a real American guy. John yeah. Burger. <laughs> Let's see. If he was trying to go a bit cultural, he was just trying to go a bit co- cultural. He could go Hugh Wang, Hugh Wang, Hugh G Wang. Okay, so while at NYU, two kids attending an arts camp recognized Rodney from his wanted poster, and he was arrested in 1971. But unfortunately, Tally's parents wouldn't let her testify, and so they couldn't get a rape conviction. He only served three years behind bars. <sighs> Apparently, he had learned a little too much from Professor Polanski because less than two months after his release, he was arrested again for assaulting a 13-year-old girl, and he served two more years. Rodney claimed another victim after his release when his parole officer allowed him to travel from L.A. to New York to visit family, despite knowing he was a high-risk offender, not to mention a flight risk. While in New York, he murdered a college student named Elaine Hover. Might have been Hover. But it's all over now. Mm, yes. Oh, so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Christy's never going to be able to satisfy you again, is she? <laughs> Make puns she to me. Puns. Make puns to me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love it so much. Once Rodney returned to L.A., he was able to secure work under his real name at the Los Angeles Times as a typesetter. But at night, he would find attractive young women. A typesetter? Back when newspapers were, like, not digitally printed, they would be... Context. Yep. Yeah. I I, I ran a typesetter in high school. It was cool. They are really cool pieces of machinery. They stink. The the chemicals stink. Yeah, I I have an old boss who used to work at one of these old printing presses and he used to have to grease the machines, right? So that they keep rolling throughout the day. And that chemical burned the fuck out of his nostrils. Like he couldn't smell a thing. I smoked weed in, in the building. I smoked so much weed in the building that I worked with him in. I was like, you can't smell it. I don't give a shit. I stuck this hand in a printing press. Ooh, how did that feel? Yeah, not good. No. Tickled. Dude, it was depressing. <laughs> oh! No, but I really oh! did. I, I think I'd tell the story at some point on something, but yeah, not good. He went back there and repressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah, so good. Uh, So at night, Rodney would find attractive young women and use the skills that he learned at NYU to pose as a fashion photographer, convincing them to take part in a photo shoot for his portfolio. Many of the women he approached were never seen again. Between working as both a typesetter and serial killer, as well as being considered a suspect in the Hillside Strangler murders, Rodney found some free time to go on the popular game show, The Dating Game. He was bachelor number one, playing for a date with Cheryl Bradshaw. He claimed that he was a successful fashion photographer who enjoyed riding motorcycles and skydiving. Behind the curtain, Rodney's creepy and suggestive answers intrigued Cheryl, so much so that she chose Lucky Bachelor number one for their date. But backstage, the two had a conversation and Cheryl backed out of going on the date. She later told reporters that he made her feel sick and he was creepy. Unfortunately for LA, Rodney didn't take the rejection so well. Ronnie was finally caught in 1979. 12-year-old Robin Samso was abducted near Huntington Beach, and her body was found 12 days days later in the Los Angeles foothills. 
Friends of Robin told police that a man had approached them at the beach and said he wanted to take their pictures. They were able to give a sketch artist a description, and Rodney's parole officer recognized him right away. When they searched Rodney's mother's house, they found keys to a storage locker, and inside that storage locker were Robin's earrings. They arrested him in July of 1979, and he was sentenced to death the first time in 1980. The verdict was overturned and a new trial was set where he was again sentenced to death. Rodney was eventually tied to several more rapes and murders and underwent yet another trial, this time choosing to represent himself, spending five hours on the stand, asking him questions in a deep voice, addressing himself as Mr. Alcala, and then answering himself in his normal voice. <laughs> Did he move either side? Did he like go into the seat and then go? That'd outside? be awesome, actually. He goes and sits in the witness stand <laughs> and then runs yeah. around to the front. And then runs side. around. <laughs> and then sits back down. <laughs> well, this is what I'm saying about him trying to copy other. Like he was trying to do the whole Ted Bundy thing, and he was the reason they thought he was the Hillside Stranglers because he was fucking killing people and leaving them like the Hillside Stranglers like the D'Angelo and whatever the fucking those guys' names were, they were just like, yeah, we killed all these people. We didn't kill those. So they eventually came around to telling it was Randy Alcala that did it. But like, this guy was a uh, scary man, scary guy. He was. Super smart and deadly. So Rodney was again at the third trial sentenced to death. His death sentence was never carried out. However, he died of natural causes on death row on July 24th, 2021. Peace. He was 77. Out. Uh, Even though he was only ever tied to eight victims, police believe he could have had anywhere from 50 to 130. Fuck. He tried to take out the only other tally I've ever heard of. This is why I don't like Californian people, because they tried to kill Richard Ramirez. Yeah. I mean, do you know any other (laughs) tally? (laughs) Very uncommon name, but I like it. Okay, who's ready for the lightning round? You. <laughs> I'm just going to get a list. I'm just going to get a list of serial killer names up and then just yell them out. Oh, baby girl, it's not names. Dear God damn it. In the observatory with the rope. <laughs> <laughs> In the library with the candlestick and it was Master Master. <laughs> Uh, okay here we go two serial killers that we covered today don't technically qualify as serial killers who are they and for bonus point why richard was technically (laughs) first uh ed gein charles manson now ed gein uh only killed two people technically serial killers three over a span of time and uh, Charles Manson didn't technically kill anyone. He just told people to go kill people. Two. What did it mean when his classmates would say someone was doing a Dahmer? Justin. He, they were acting up, being class clowns kind of stuff. Question three. Following his sentencing, Richard Ramirez was escorted past cameras. He said to reporters, hey, big deal. Death always comes with the territory. He said one more thing after this. What was it? Richard. Uh, eat shit and die. I don't know. No. Bo. I, lo- I, hope, you ha- I hope you have a great afternoon. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what he actually said was, I'll see you in Disneyland. Oh, oh, yes, he did say that. I forgot about that. Fuck. Question four. <laughs> What did police find when they x-rayed Albert Fish after his arrest? Justin's first. A gooch full of pins and needles and stuff. For a bonus point, how many? 120. Wrong. 16. Of course it's wrong. Wrong. 47. Wrong. Oh. 19. What was closest? It was, in fact, 29. Wow. No! This is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard anybody cheer over his grundle pins, so you win on that side too. <laughs> All right, question five. What was Edmund Kemper's dream job? Richard was first. The popo. Mm, no. Justin was next. 
I was going to say police officer. Feeding sea turtles at SeaWorld. No. All right. Well, if it's not the police, um, not the Coast Guard in the Army? No. Oh, I have a secondary answer. If I, if I don't get it, it doesn't matter. Uh, he was so big that all he wanted to do was uh, be one of those guys that ride horses, whatever they're called, and he couldn't do it because of his size. It's a jockey, and no. He wanted to be a state trooper. For a bonus point, he was not, a, he was not accepted. Why not? Bo? He was too... He had knee problems. No, nope. Richard? Too big. Yes. Too tall. Damn it! That's what I was... Damn it! God, too tall, damn too it. heavy. Bo, come on. Give me the absolute irrits. Question six. How many times did Bundy escape prison? <gasps> Bo. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. uh, I wanted to start uh, two. Bonus points for how? Oh, I was just going to say what Dally said. He got really skinny and then he went out through a... I want to say shaft, but it keeps making me giggle. Um, oh, he, he went window. out through a. Help me out, Tully. First time he jumped through a window. He went out through a, sh- a shaft. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Question seven. What was Rodney Alcala's answer to the dating game question? I am serving you for dinner. What are you called and what do you look like? Richard was first. Banana. This, his answer was, You're banana, and I'm going to serve you like. Fuck, I can't remember what he said it like, but it's a banana. He said banana for fuck's sakes. He did say banana, but he said more than that. You you know what he's serving for dinner. What does he look like? Justin. Long. Eh, close. This one was worth three, worth three points. So Roger, Richard got one of them. What he said was, I'm called the banana and I look really good. Peel me. Gross. How many victims did H.H. Holmes claim he killed in his confession? Whoa. <laughs> oh, I can't remember. I know that there's been someone who claimed 200, someone who claimed 100. He did claim 200, but not in his confession. Oh! <laughs> yep. Richard. Uh, 65. No. Anybody? Justin. 13. No. Tally. 36. No, it was, it was in fact 27. All right, but you're not out of the woods yet. For a bonus point, is it possible he was telling the truth? And why? Who got, who was here first? You were. Uh, No, because narcissists don't tell the truth. Possibly, but Mm. like, I mean, like definitively, absolutely. The bones didn't like the bits of things didn't didn't add up to the same amount of people. That's a really good answer, but no. <laughs> Damn it, <laughs> Richard. Uh, yes, it's possible. Why? Because he made a murder mansion, and it's impossible to figure out how many he actually killed. So twenty-seven seems like a number that could exist. Why not? No, Justin. I'm the only anybody else there is. Some of the people he claimed to kill were dead. Justin's right. That is absolutely right. Many of them were found oh, alive and well. Fuck. God, that was a lot. Was luckier than a dog with two dicks on that one. After the murder of Mary Ann Nichols, the local prostitutes pointed the finger at a local Jewish shoemaker who had been extorting money from them uh, as being Jack the Ripper. His name was John Pizer. But he, what was he known as around Whitechapel? What was his nickname? The Jew. Yeah, no, not this one. <laughs> Joseph. The Shoe Jew. Nope. The Shoe Jew. <laughs> what did he do for a living? Um, he was a shoemaker. <laughs> a shoemaker. Yes. Made shoes. A Jew with a soul. A Jew. Hebrew heat. No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The kosher cobbler. No. (laughs) Clever, but no. The the Hebrewski. Okay, much less clever. People were not frivolous enough back then. Okay. John the Jew. No. Richard. 
Oh, uh, Johnny the Jew. No. <laughs> he was known around Whitechapel as Leather Apron. Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. Well, that's not racist at all. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you mention he was a Jew? He didn't me. <laughs> You I mean, she didn't. Said any she didn't. I said Jew. I said the Jew. She just uh, said he was a shoemaker. No, I didn't. I said he was a Jewish shoemaker. Oh, did you? I yeah. thought you said his last. It's name. relevant to the culture at the time. <laughs> but he had his leather apron trimmed off. It's three a.m. for Richard. Holy fuck! Yeah. All right. Sorry, Richard. What did Charles Manson's followers do to mutilate themselves during trial to show solidarity? Justin. Crucifixes. Carve shit in their heads was it a crucifix well his was eventually they did an x his was a swastika event x very good what happened to ed Gein's farmhouse justin burnt down it did indeed what was Dahmer's apartment number <gasps> justin again two no tally 103 nope richard 4d nope Bo, you, your answer was five? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't five. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Depends, is it right? <laughs> uh, two. No, four, seven. No, tally. 17. Nope. 54. No, Richard. 69. <laughs> What number is better than 69? 88, because you get eight twice. Jesus Christ. No, it's not, in fact. Richard. 420. It's not. I knew that was coming. Oh, my gosh, you guys. <laughs> his apartment number was 213. 213. That's not as sexual at all. <laughs> it's not racist at all. <laughs> 1408. <laughs> 1408. Ah, good reference. <laughs> Albert Fish had a murder kit containing a saw, a cleaver, and a butcher's knife. What did he call these instruments? Tally. Tools of destru destruction. Mm, close, but no. Yeah, well, I close know. Close-ish, but no. It's always close, but no cigar. Richard. Tools of the trade. Nope. Tally. Tools of murder. No. <laughs> If tools of destruction is kind of close, tools of mild inconvenience? Tools of destruction was close-ish. <laughs> mild inconvenience. <laughs> His fun kit. Tally. Murder kit. Nope. All right, anybody else? Come on, Bo. Not me? Yeah! His <laughs> happy-go-fun-time kit. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> The only way I get hard. He called them his implements of hell. Oh, that is kind of oh. that's kind of poetic. No, it's My not modern to the time Viagra. When Ramirez got married in prison, his wife wore a gold wedding band and he wore silver. Why did he wear a silver band? Tally. He's a goddamn werewolf. No. All the gold was in his tooth. <laughs> wrong, wrong one. Because um, he, because uh, he was number two, and she was number one. Nope. That's cute, Justin. Because he was a banana, and the gold wouldn't show up against the yellow. No, that was Rodney Alcala. That Callie. one song that goes silver and gold. No. Silver. Okay. <laughs> Richard. Budgetary reasons. No. <laughs> he couldn't wear gold in the prison? He quite literally didn't give a fuck. No tally, no bow. Okay. Oh, fuck. No bow. Richard. The Jew. No. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the Stew Jew. <laughs> This is a quote from him, by the way. Like, he said this. This was his reason. He's a murderer. No. Can't be pure. Because Satanists don't wear gold. Why? I don't know. Because they don't wear gold. That is bullshit. 
then he does not represent the satanic temple. I don't know. I'll Google it. I'll Google Satanism and see what gold. No, but uh, let's be honest. Satanists don't fucking murder people and Satanists don't do a lot of shit that he did. So he doesn't really know what he's he's not speaking for Satanists. Last question. What was the name of H.H. Holmes Murder Hotel? Sally. House of Horrors. It was not. Dustin. The Fuck Shack Deluxe. It was not. Richard. (laughs) The Continental Hotel. It was not. Fuck, what was it called? Harm Beat Harm. (laughs) Bo, it was not. Richard. (laughs) The The Smack Shack. It wasn't. Acid addition building. No, you can all just turn your cameras back on now because I'm murder know. castle. I get it. No, the bait haste. You guys, no one's gonna come and stay at a hotel called Murder Castle. <laughs> murder uh, castle. I think. I think today. Future post office. People would go in. Hotel? Holiday no. Inn. No. Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a Hilton Express. <laughs> the W. No. Happy Good Fun Time Hotel. Yes, it is. It was something like the Continental or some shit like that. It's got to be. The Cecil Hotel. It wasn't. It had no name. What? Oh, uh, trick question. question and you it doesn't it. matter. The everyone, is, it had everyone no right now, flip your fucking table at the same time. <laughs> or we will never gain respect back. No, that was a good one. You got us. So flip your fucking table. Hey, you know what? Yeah. True crime fanatics would know that. They'd be right up my ass about it. I guarantee you someone is listening to this episode right now and going, it has no name. It has no fucking name. I guarantee you. Yeah. It's your mom. Someone is screaming in there. Yes. (laughs) That wasn't a your mom joke. Oh my God. I never make those. I swear. It's all good. That is the end of Serial Killer Trivia. That was fun as fuck. That was cool. All right. Let's tally up the scores. Oh. Oh, I win. That's up to me. Let's let's Richard up the scores. Oh snap! I win. Let's Ricky up those scores. Rickety scores. Rickety Ricky split. Cheetah. Real. I bet that's what your wife calls you. That's my that's my drag name for sure. Uh-huh. Rickety know. split. No Ricky Cheetah, but Rickety split. <laughs> Rickety <too>. split. <laughs> Rickety split's a good one. That would be if I was like an abandoning my wife. Uh, I'm so funny. Rickety split. <laughs> no, that's what happens when you uh, are getting um, uh, spit roasted. Ladies and gentlemen, I have calculated the scores. Drum roll. It was real. It was neck and neck. We right? all win. It was a real nail biter. It absolutely was not. <laughs> We're all winners in our personality. Here. In second place, we have Italian <laughs> Bow with. Oh, God damn it! Eight points. Tally and Bow with eight points. Naturally. Hey, you, hey, you got eight. I wasn't born in the 1800s. What would I be doing this is there? This the worst day of my life. In first place, <laughs> we have Richard and Justin. Because they're old. With a total of 23 points. Because they were yeah! born in the 1800s. Uh, we get it. 23 points. Holy fuck. I thought I needed RJ to beat you guys, but... Wow. No, wait, you got literally almost three times more of us. Yeah, but it was a good day. You got eight. Plus, I I, I uh, am a vampire, and I was there for half of these things. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. No, for you sure. You read the Fox News reports. I'm never going to emotionally recover from this. Just for reference, there was a potential of <laughs> 42 points. For home. Oh, so you guys sucked as well. Ha! Ah! No, that's uh, that, that's pretty shitty. So between the two of you, you have <laughs> thirty-one points. That's enough. Out of forty-two, that's a shaft. That was good though. That uh, uh, a lot of stuff I didn't know, which is uh, kind of scary. Why did we not mention Warnos? Because we covered her on Patreon already. Oh well, guess who wasn't there for that? It's on Patreon. All right, <laughs> listeners. Thank you for playing with us. I hope you beat all your friends. I hope you had fun playing with yourselves. I really hope you did. (laughs) I did. (laughs) We love you guys so much. Yeah, it's awesome. 
we don't get to say it enough on the show. I was thinking about this the other day because we try to get right into it most of the times, but I do really appreciate everyone that listens and it's awesome that you do. And it's great that you guys go on and rate another show. And as you're going to tell all your friends and all that kind of stuff, it's super awesome. We have built a wicked little community here and we couldn't do any of this shit without you guys. So thank you very, very much. guys thanks so much for listening head on over to our facebook and instagram to join in on the conversations about all things unethical just search unethical podcast you can also find us on patreon where you can get access to all of our super awesome content uncut videos of our discussions and early release of all the episodes we are adding fun stuff all the time so you should definitely come and check it out thanks again we appreciate all of you Cause I'm straight when it comes to humans, but fucking gay from old people.